I love that quote. I think. Uh, I love it. Oh, oh, okay. We're we're on. All right. Fair well, uh, hello everyone. There's no one watching us right now, but there are people in the future. So <laughs> welcome, future people, um, to uh, to the show. So this is my my third video on my my fledgling, uh, you know, YouTube channel, and I'm joined today uh, with uh, Diamond Klein. Diamond Klein, what are you? You're like the you're like the super editor of American Reformer now. You're like the, yeah, the maximum editor, Uber Mensch sort of editor guy, exactly. publishing yeah. Nietzsche and articles or whatever. No, um, That's exactly how I put it. Yeah, yeah, no. So yeah, from American Reformer and all that, great guy. Uh, Hillsdale grad too, so he's a part of that mafia. I'm not a I'm not a Hillsdale grad. That's I thought that's you bad. were. Okay, no, I, I'm, I make whatever. Fun of this the is, this, mafia is a, all the time. this is obnoxious banter that I'm against at, at the beginning <laughs> of any sort of podcast. So we're going to end the banter. Right. So what we're going to do yeah. today is um, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, so Bill Roach, and I don't know if you know him or not, but he I believe he has a PhD in philosophy. He's been kind of an anti-Christian nationalist guy for the last few weeks. He went on the Jenna Ellis show and Jenna Ellis, uh, I, I didn't really know her very well, but suddenly she called me a snake. And so I uh, got my attention. Uh, that was enough. And uh, they, they, she interviewed him, Bill Roach for uh, her show that's on YouTube um, posted on her. She has 1 million followers on, uh, on Twitter, which wow. is congratulations. That's pretty cool. Um, but uh, we're going to kind of react to some of what they are saying here. I don't know how long we, we might, it, it, we might keep, we might go until like one in the morning. I don't know. Um, see how long <laughs> this goes. Uh, but um, yeah. So are you ready time into I'm ready, man. So this is my first time trying to manage this nonsense. So bear with me, watcher, viewer. There he is. All right. This is Bill Bill Roach, Dr. Bill Roach. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm going to call him Bill uh, because we both have PhDs. So I'm going to assume <laughs> I can do that. But um, all right. So he's reacting. Uh, this is on minute 12, uh, 12, 15. Or twelve twenty. Uh, I they they did some you know introductions before and some uh, things that you know uh, kind of intro sort of thing. Not, they didn't get to specifics, so let's just jump in uh, right here and we can whenever you want. I can stop or you just jump in. Time in. So, okay. All right, let's go. We saw this happen over the last few years, and I was hoping that the evangelical church would have kind of caught on to it. I don't think they did, and like you were saying. When you look at the whole woke movement, you notice how it worked. You know, you can be woke depending on how you define the term, who actually gets to define the term. And did you notice this? There's this, this fancy term. It's usually something like epistemic privileged place or epistemic privileged point. And what they mean by that is, is that if you are from a particular perspective or from a particular point of view, you have greater status to speak on something. And we know how that worked with the woke movement is that if you held a certain race or a certain intersectionality point, you had the privilege because you have the, the special knowledge to discuss this particular issue. And what's interesting is, is that it ended up being this silencer of conversation with people that if you don't hold that, you either don't know it, you can't know it, you can't speak to it. So you just have to trust and obey exactly what we're saying. And it's funny because that's exactly what Christian nationalists are doing it. Okay. Exactly what Christian nationalists are doing that they're just, they're doing the same woke, you know, evasive, um, uh, epimistic, what epistemological privileging of certain voices. I don't know what that means. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think I kind of know what he's getting at the idea of kind of in the, within the woke circles. Well, I mean, you know all about this stuff, isn't there? Well, yeah, the, you I know get more the, than I know um, about this. I get the no, I get the. I mean, insofar as he's talking about what the the woke did, as your you know your identity markers or whatever your your intersectional makeup gives you a certain epistemic privilege. But I don't understand the. Uh, I mean, you've seen a lot of people do this, try to analogize between woke stuff that was going on to now Christian nationalism. And I don't really follow uh, most of it. I don't really understand the analogy. I don't, I don't th think it's a very good analogy, but in this case in particular, I don't really, I'm, I'm not understanding where, where he's trying to draw the parallel, like who, who's making that claim. I mean, it, essentially you, you're the only person they mentioned, right. In the whole, 
in the whole uh, segment. So what's how yeah, it's, it's really not like it's not clear to me who is who's saying that there is a sort of epistemic privilege to define it. Uh, I, I think maybe what he's getting at is that if you go on Twitter, you'll see all sorts of, uh, you know, different people saying this or that. This is Christian nationalism. That is Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. But then he's taking it to be like holistically to be a sort of strategy that we're all somehow me and a bunch right. of the nons right. get, get together, all, all hundreds of us get together in the back channels and we strategize like, okay, you're going to yeah. say this ridiculous thing. I'm going to say this ridiculous thing and it's all going to be contradictory. And then we're going to like gaslight them and saying they don't actually know what right. the definition is when really it's just a bunch of people saying a bunch of stuff. It's not coordinated. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's turned into this kind of like conspiracy, uh, like, so like grand strategy R rather than like the more, the more, the, 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 the simpler way to understand what's going on is that it's kind of an early movement. It's an early idea. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are trying to figure out what they believe, how they articulate it, how they define it, what they mean by it, what the program is for you know Christian nationalism. Some people who don't even want to take a label, they'll they still want to take some ideas of the politics or and they're still, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're sympathetic. And so they'll say this is what it is. It's not what it is. It's not like some grand strategy of saying you can't define it. You can't say what it is. Yeah. Yeah, and it, maybe this is kind of like you're saying, just an effect of, of the stage. I mean, when I was talking to Jared Longshore several months ago about some of this, not just Christian nationalism, but, uh, you know, things going on in the evangelical right or whatever we want to call it. And, you know, my my understanding or kind of assessment of the situation is we're still in a very much like an incubation stage of ideas. And they're still, like you said, being worked out. And proposed and a lot of that is just occasion to recover old ideas from the tradition and so yeah it looks a little you know messy and no one has control of it and not everything is rigidly defined and it's it's very much a con at least if, as i've experienced it is very much a conversation um but i haven't really seen the uh i mean i think he's kind of talking about a, a gatekeeping function and maybe what bill has experienced is when they say when they say ridiculous things, the opponents, I guess, of Christian nationalism. So, I mean, he's a sovereign nations guy, right? So it's it's that kind of crowd. And we tell them that they're wrong in what they're in their assessment of the ideas in play, then they get frustrated. And we tell them, well, you, you may not have the operative categories to engage well with this if you haven't read certain things. And then that maybe that comes across as a sort of gatekeeping function. But I would just see it as a earnest sort of attempt to uh, bring people up to speed. I don't know. Yeah. And I think what we'll see, the, the, the theme I get from the broad kind of interview and what he says is the, the, the strategy here is to, instead of, uh, instead of dealing with the, the arguments, say of my book and kind of the, you know, the complexity of them and, and the distinctions, it's easy. It's easier. And, and also instead of seeing that it's, it's based in older ideas of Protestant, you know, like the Protestant mm -hmm. reformers and the, the development in, uh, uh, centuries later, instead of seeing it in that light, which would be more favorable, it's like, mm -hmm. Oh, you quote Calvin and you quote the founders and you quote Witherspoon and you quote these, these, you know, talk mm -hmm. about cotton Mather, like all that sounds to a, a Christian. Okay. You know, I can, I, I respect those guys to a certain degree. I can listen to this. Um, but that that's too favorable. And so instead, the strategy is to say, OK, it's Marxist. It's, you know, neo Marx, it's cultural Marx, it's postmodern, it's fascist. It's we, we know Hitler comes up later on in the video. Uh, it's <laughs> it's all these things that are scary that mm -hmm. so, you know, that you that's what it is. It's all these things that violate the founding. It's like if you got a bunch of people who are over like 65 in a room this is the message you would give them and they'd be terrified. Oh, this is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, because their, their entire lives, the, their, the greatest enemy is Marxism and Hitler or Marxism and fascism. Mm -hmm. And so if you frame everything in that light, um, that, that makes it scary. So that, that means yeah. no, nothing else. It, it really is a sort of poisoning in the well. I think we'll see this later on. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit, but, um, it, you see kind of a poisoning of the well, meaning that, no matter how much of a distinction I make. So if I say, yeah, I, I did say that a civil ruler may um, punish blasphemy, may pl punish heresy, may do this and that, okay, may do that. Yeah. Uh, and then I say, well, permissibility doesn't mean suitability in every, in every situation. 
And I, I, I apply that distinction, which is a classical <clears throat> distinction that everyone made until yesterday. And I say it explicitly in the book several times. Mm -hmm. That <laughs> distinction is rejected because, oh, you're just trying to trick us. You're postmodern. You're just trying to, you know, it's yeah. you're shifting the you're doing the Mott and Bailey. You know, it's one of those things. Instead of dealing mm -hmm. with the arguments in themselves, you have this very deep suspicion that it's ultimately Marxist, fascist, Hitlerist, or whatever. And yeah, yeah. so I'm gonna head. Well, that's myself. that we talked about that on the uh, on that spaces the other night. Of this is this is kind of a new one, at least that I've noticed is the. I don't know the the characterization of the the breakdown you just gave of a distinction between principle and prudence as being as being sort of disingenuous or like you said a Mott and Bailey uh, maneuver rather than just the the basic. correct posture to approach you know uh, politics. So I, yeah, very basic. I don't I don't really get that. Um, it's certainly not. I mean, I'm I'm certainly perfectly willing to admit all the things in principle I would I believe in such as punishing blasphemy whatever um but then also very willing to say it has to be prudentially orchestrated um and you have to you know whatever lead men to to virtue gradually these sorts of things and I don't see them as contradictory but these guys seem to I don't know think that they've they've sort of uh smoked us out you know at, at that point of like now we're really revealing our our true intentions which is to i guess trick everybody i i don't know it's very bizarre yeah and that, that's been the most frustrating thing about the book is that like the loudest voices i mean on, on a different note i guess or related note uh well the most frustrating thing for me is that you can't well like with people and I, i've never talked with i don't think bill directly uh, i've talked to people he's associated with mm -hmm. um, with the sovereign nations crowd and just that kind of orbit and I, I remember it was a few months ago. I, I, I think I spent three hours discussing something with someone that everyone here knows. I don't know if you know, but for three hours. And by the end of it, I thought, like, this is a guy who talks about rationality. He's a guy who talks mm -hmm. about reason and, you know, natural, natural, this and that. After three hours, there was no progress in the conversation, like yeah. zero progress. Like, you know, even if like, like if you and I disagree on something, mm -hmm. I think that you and I could talk it out. And even at the, if in the end, we'd still disagree, like mm -hmm. we, we've refined the arguments, we've defined the terms, we've clarified, um, we've under, we've come to some understanding of our positions much better than before. But the, most of the critics of Christian nationalism are the opposite. You can spend hours talking to them and you make zero progress. Mm -hmm. And I think it's from this very kind of posture that you see half the bat here which is that, I mean, we'll see you later, that it's like you're trying to frame them in these dark, scary, post-war sort of terminology that just prevents the actual progress in, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it's just, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's been the most frustrating part about it. Like these, the loudest people, I could just say, no, I don't affirm that, or I, I distinguish this from that, and it doesn't matter at all, at yeah. all. And they'll just yeah. continue, they'll keep saying what they originally said over and over and over. And like I've said, it's like uh, before, it's like whack-a-mole. Like one guy says this, whack. And then another guy said that, whack. Yeah. And then the other guy who just said something, he says it again, whack. I mean, it's pointless yeah. for me to spend my days doing that. Um, anyway, I'm just yeah venting on that frustration. <laughs> no, I think that's right. I mean, anyone that follows your your, your Twitter, I mean, that's that's essentially what it's filled up with uh, in your replies to people. Yeah. So, you know, whatever. At some point, especially, you know, it's the it's this crowd. I mean, it's it's the you know G three crowd to some extent. That's as this type of engagement. And there's other people that are opposed to maybe some of your ideas or, or Christian nationalism as a label, whatever. But it's it seems to be these two groups in particular, which obviously have overlap, that have have sort of executed the the strategy you're talking about, where it's it's clearly not meant to be a, a debate or a real discussion, but they're appealing to certain constituencies that they probably think you're strategically targeting to try to, you know, steal away from them or, or something. I'm not sure, but they're, they're clearly not, um, they're not there to really engage the, the ideas or even try to, it's, it's pretty one dimensional. Yeah. I, I think that's thing. what like the Charles Haywood thing was all about. I, I've never talked yeah. to the guy on the phone. I don't think I've ever exchanged emails with the guy. I, I know yeah. of him. I guess I've read a couple of things by him. Um, and 
but then somehow he becomes like the dark center of Christian nationalism and yeah. integralism and all these things. And I'm just sitting back like, yeah. what is going on? <laughs> what, like, why can't you just deal with my argument here? Here's a syllogism. Yeah. Like which premise is false? Where's yeah. the invalid reasoning? Like, let's go with that level yeah. instead of dark and notorious. Charles Haywood is, is like, you know, yeah. paying, paying wolf on the side to, I, it's just crazy yeah. stuff. The, and Nate Fisher owns a ammo company or, you know, whatever yeah. else. <laughs> yeah. It's very oh, sinister man. stuff. Um, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, that maybe that helps them make sense of things and it's kind of got to be that way or they're, or they're, you know, maybe they're just predisposed to expect that because it's new. It's, it's scary. I don't, I don't know. Um, but it does, it does continually reveal their uh, lack of familiarity with the, with the tradi tradition, not that you can't disagree with aspects of the tradition or try to refine it or apply it in new ways, but they're, um, because it seems so foreign to them, obviously, based on their reception of the ideas, means they're unfamiliar. And then further, I mean, what you're getting at is um, the type of engagement. If you, if you spend enough time in older texts, um, I think it it changes the way you engage with arguments generally, and especially ones that are pre uh, presented in the similar format, whether it's syllogistic or just, you know, the sort of um, style of using using the tra tradition itself to to make arguments, which is done in a certain way, um, and it's not considered to be out of bounds or sidestepping scripture or whatever else. Um, so all those sort of preliminary, I think they're distractions, but preliminary objections that. I thought eventually we'd get past them and be like a, an initial hurdle. And it's like, well, that's fine. You know, it's evangelicalism. They're, they're conditioned to think a certain way and expect certain types of arguments from their, their leaders. So that's what they're expecting. This defies expectations, but eventually they'll all get tired of just doing that. And if they're going to engage further, the, the objections will move to a different place, but they've pretty much hung out at least for, for certain people we're talking about in the same area for like a year, uh, which is really weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's been, been pretty frustrating. And and then like, I mean, there, there have been, I mean, I complain about these people, but there have been, uh, good engagements of, of the book. Uh, yeah. but th those, at least one in particular was like, well, Hegel, like you just Hegelian and that's un-American, which is a fine yeah. argument. I'm, I'm not against, like, I don't think it's wrong in principle, but it doesn't actually deal with yeah. anything particular. Like I, yeah. I could, okay, yeah. fine. It's Hegelian. But maybe it's still true. Um, right. But yeah, obviously, as an American, I don't, I don't want to avoid being an American. Uh, right. But but nevertheless, it, yeah, that, th those yeah. were and then there's some other ones. Well, you want to keep going? Yeah, let's keep going. We, we've done like like five let's seconds. Do more bills. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't have their epistemic privilege place of which you can address this topic or if you define it a little differently or whichever means they're going to give you, you don't have the rights and the privilege to speak to it sounds woefully similar doesn't it because what yeah, it, it is sounds, it sounds a, a lot like tactic a yeah i i don't know what he's talking about i i don't know, I don't know. anyone who said you don't have a right to speak on this I and mean, we've said like do the reading but that's yeah. because they, they like they fail to make like the basic distinctions at times and so yeah. we're like look yeah. you guys just and it also became the, kind of a, also became kind of a joke too because yeah. eventually like you have to be a little snarky just because it's you see the same dumb stuff over and over and you try to correct it over and over and they don't care so you're going to be just in the end you're going to you're going to say what i say is like you know try to think clearly or, yeah. or one of these yeah. lines that uh, <laughs> what else are you going to do um, no the do the reading one is my favorite i mean i use it for all <laughs> kinds of contexts it's not just a, for christian nationalism and it's basically a a thing of you know, yeah i mean it it means what it what it says but it's also you know somewhat tongue-in-cheek or light-hearted i'm not telling anyone they can't engage. In fact, I would love for them to actually take that request seriously. And that would be a, that would be a huge win, actually, if you can just get them to read the stuff. They don't have to agree, but if they would actually just go read it. Um, you know, I was like, Joe, with this Richard Baxter course, I'm, I'm teaching sorry, with Michael Lynch. I was joking plug. Like with people signing up. That a, I did do a shameless plug starts next week. So it's, it's too late oh, to sign okay, up. Okay, um, okay. But the, you know, I was, I, I was joking. In, on Twitter when people were expressing interest of like, if anyone showed up not doing the reading, they'd get the Baxter meme. This is please do the reading like in their inbox every week. So it's just a joke, but if, if, you know, in some ways it is, it is earnest. It would be great if they would read, even just read like, you know, read the institutes from Calvin and the institutes from Turretin 
um, in a detailed way without your some of your evangelical priors, modern ones. And even if you come away still disagreeing, that would be great. I just imagine most of these people have not done that. So please do the reading, then come back and we can engage on the, you know, <laughs> the material, the source material. I don't know why that's yeah. so weird. But if he doesn't mean that, if that's not what it is in mind for him, then I have absolutely zero idea what he's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's I, I either. I mean, if, if it's sincere, I think he's just mistaken this analogy or this comparison that it's we're we're, we're just woke or, or we're like we're just like the woke and therefore bad. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, another thing just to kind of an aside, I guess, of what you just said. So I, I, like, I like to tell people um, that if you're going to read kind of the original sources, don't read them with the frame of what you've heard uh, in the last mm -hmm. few decades. So if you're thinking, mm -hmm. oh, Calvin's a theonomist, and so I'm going to read yeah. him in that light, or Calvin's a, I don't know, like um, the your favorite postmillennialist, and that's you have to think mm -hmm. of him in that terms. I, I would just kind of not do that. Like try to try to yeah. think of what he's saying in his own terms. That's just a suggestion. Yeah. Um, so or even Calvin the proto liberal, you know, is another one not to do. Yeah, yeah don't don't do that. Yeah, that's <laughs> a, that for sure. That, does that's a, what is his, what's his name? Does that uh, to Tuininga or whatever? Didn't he? Yeah, that that, that, yeah. that book was frustrating to me. I, that was a few years ago. I read it, but yeah, that, I think that if I remember right, not trying to misrepresent, you know, anything, but that's that's essentially where he ends up, and then you drive that into like the American context, and it's like. So now reformed people can be proud of liberal Amer secular America because it's really all in Calvin. You know? So it's like, okay, <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah, that went wrong. Um, okay, let's see here. Go back to... A postmodern tactic to stop conversation to achieve long-term goals. And like you said, the long-term goal is to ultimately nullify religious freedom and freedom of speech in the public sphere. Yeah, it sounds a okay. So to <laughs> nullify freedom of speech and religious, so we'll we'll get more of the you know they just want to destroy the the constitution line uh, later. I don't know if we want to put that off, but um, I, I think well, first of all, when he said like shut down conversation, I don't yeah. think we're the ones doing that. that right. I, I am very open to talking. Um, I, I mean, I'm I'm pretty lazy when it comes to writing. I admit. But I'm pretty open to like talking to people about these ideas and, and to work out our differences. Uh, but it's if you're just going to say you guys are postmodern Marxists and like I don't know how do I I just deny it? If I deny it, you're probably going to say that that affirm that confirms, you know. So you know I'm Kafka trapped. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Right, and you're not going to. I mean, denying over and over and over. I mean, if you had someone who was in good faith coming to you and confused um, and just said, Hey, this, you know, are you this? I mean, you, you would have an incentive there to deny it and then explain to them, but you know, these sort of Twitter quips and jabs or whatever, and then you're usually blocked after a while. If you engage too much in a way they don't like, then, you know, this, this is not as uh, it's, it's certainly not a good faith scenario. So denying over and over that you're an authoritarian or something. I mean, it's just, it just gets tedious and pointless. So, but the, yeah, we can, the religious liberty thing in particular, I mean, we can sort of, we can sort of package that with, con cause I think he, he gets to like free speech, which I guess he's already, he's already touching on here, uh, religious liberty. And then I mean, there might be a couple, of, it's really the bill of rights he's talking about, not, not the constitutional structure or order. Yeah. I don't think they get into that. So really they're going to talk about the bill of rights and we can, we can hit them all in a block. Uh, once they get yeah it. so let's keep going then yeah. a lot like the left saying no uterus no opinion you're a man you can't speak on abortion if you're white <laughs> then you can't speak to the black experience what? or conversely by saying Who well is if you're doing not a any biologist of that? you can't i've never well talked about a uterus so they before use on both Twitter. of these <laughs> both the sure. um, experiential and the epistemological as well as their experts and their credentials to then excise anyone from public speech and debate whose opinions they don't want and they can censor anyone and they can ultimately what go back to this totalitarian uh, society and this kind of authoritarianism that they prefer. So we have to take a break uh, right here, but I'm speaking with Dr. Bill Roach and we're talking about the importance of understanding Christian nationalism. Do we have our own like sponsors or an ad to take a break to? Yeah. Or? No, I, I don't. <laughs> I don't have, uh, okay. I don't have any sponsors yet. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, maybe I should start doing an ad for like our goat milk. Like I'll ship you. Uh, <laughs> we have goat milk, for sale. goat milk. Yeah, Wolfshire goat milk. Maybe some eggs. Mix in some people eggs. Pay, with that. People will pay for that, man. Yeah, yeah. Goat milk gets goaty after a while, though. So you don't want. That's it. true. I'm not a. I'm not a huge. <laughs> no, I mean, at first, at like first, that. it's good. At first, it's almost yeah, like yeah. cow's milk. But then you let it sit for a little while, it gets a little gross. But you know, whatever. Yeah, what I, when I was growing up over overseas, we couldn't get you know, cow's milk. So it was like, I had a lot of goat milk stuff as a kid. I just never, never got a taste for it. Like goat milk and cereal is kind of, is something's off about it. It's just not quite there, but anyway. Well, you're gonna have to come to our house and uh, anyway, the, this is a- Yeah, I need to get the good no, stuff. No one I'll, wants to I'll hear about that. Wolfshire goat milk right now on, on Twitter. Oh, the, we but, don't know that. There could be a market. Maybe they do. Name. Maybe they, I'm probably yeah, gonna email us about this. The things that Stephen does in his book and other figures try to do, and there are other books on it, is they want to just give this slam down definition. And I think they realize that what does obviously words in different know. movements okay. have to be defined. There has to be a parameter within that. I give them good faith in that regard. But then you'll notice these interesting little things that they're doing. They say, we don't want to discuss it historically. And the reason they'll say that is because there's too much baggage or maybe it clouds their definition or whatever means they're going to give to it. But I go, that's precisely where we need to go. So when you look at the history of the So I think actually of everything he says, this is the most legitimate objection. I think everything else mm -hmm. is, is horrible. But I think this is the most legitimate objection to give him credit. Uh, and because I do in the introduction say, I don't care what you think nationalism is or isn't. I'm just, I'm going to define it. I'm going to describe what I'm describing and whether or not historical examples overlaps or, or whatever, or doesn't is up to you to decide. And I, mm -hmm. uh, I so, and I, one of the reasons was that I, I didn't, I didn't approach the topic thinking, Oh, there's this historical phenomena called phenomenon called uh, nationalism. Let me try to define what nationalism is historically as a mm -hmm. bunch of, you know, use a bunch of cases and then come build this theory of what it is and then try to fit Christian nationalism into that. And so mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that, obviously, first of all, because I think it'd be boring to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and second of all, I don't think it'd be fruitful to, to approach it that way. I said, I want to define this conceptually and uh, start with what a nation is, work myself away into nationalism. Um, so I, I don't think, so I know people have disagreed with this. I think it's a legitimate criticism. I don't think it's a, it's ultimately successful. Um, and, and it wasn't me trying to avoid bad examples it was me simply trying to avoid that that method of again compiling cases building a theory and then trying to fit my theory into that theory mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so yeah i don't know i don't know what you think about when, that. and he uh no i think i mean it's a it's it's a it's not a in your book it's a it's a theoretical and polemical choice that's not hidden. So therefore it's not illegitimate. Yeah. Someone can it, disagree with the, uh, the conclusions you come to, or even they could even disagree with the, the definition, which I guess is part of the conclusion of the, of the method, but they could disagree with the definition you use, um, and even use historical examples to try to poke holes in it. Um, but I think, I mean, one of the things, at least as I read it, I thought that that was a useful, it's a useful tactic on your part, because of, for the exact reason that like we're dealing with Bill Roach, which is you're just going to insist, they're going to insist upon talking about post 20th century, you know, nationalism as defined by historians and sort of imposed upon certain social and political phenomenon of that period. And if you're really appealing to sources and ways of or politically organizing that stand behind that, then it would make little sense to engage with the the mountains of you know literature on quote unquote nationalism, fascism, all these things from the 20th century. That would be kind of strange to do. Um, at the same time, so I think I can't remember exactly where he goes here. I think he's going mean, to he's going to talk about Hitler for sure. He can't not do that. But then you know I I've written about you know some of these things not in a comprehensive way, but certain elements of recovery of certain political ideas. I mean, I do, I do like to use historical examples. They're just all like 17th and 18th century ones. And we'll say, you know, this is kind of the way of life or this is the, the way of doing law and governance that I would like us to get back to in some regard. 
you know, adjusted for prudence and circumstance. I know that's, that means I'm obfuscating, but I do think that that's real. Um, so I, you know, I've, I've done some of that using this, but it's not to, it's not to arrive at like really a definition. It's just to describe a certain picture of things that's, and to demonstrate that a lot of the ideas now in play, uh, mostly because of your book, but some, you know, it's highlighted not only things in your book, but because of your book, other things, other people have said, some have also come in. It's been sort of an outlet to get them in. Um, mm -hmm. Some of those I ideas, you know, they have been illustrated. And I, what I like to emphasize is in our own country, on our own soil, not that long ago. And so they're not really foreign. So the charge that you're just bringing in, even though I've used these two, 19th century papal encyclicals or something is, you know, is bunk basically, because you can find the ideas I've I want here. So I've done that some, but I don't, I don't think um, at the same time, I'm also just avoiding, you know, some of these, uh, they're, they're almost like preliminary, pre, they're like prerequisites for a lot of people in their brains to talk about politics at all, have to have to channel through or at least pass through the, the channel that is, you know, uh, the post-war order, um, especially if you're going to, going to critique it at all. And then of course that's built upon this, foundation of, you know, what, what happened in the 20th century in the two world wars that, that is supposed to be the perpetual motivation for being liberal, being anti, you know, pre-liberal, being modernist, all these things. Um, so I find, I find it tedious and boring. So I thought that the choice, all that to say, the choice to attempt to sidestep that, knowing it's going to be imposed on you at some point anyway, because certain people just can't think otherwise. Yeah. Um, was was at least a noble effort. I mean, you know, I've said the same thing about several several things you do in the book of like, well, no one else was trying to do anything. So like, can you really fault someone's attempt when it's the first one, when you're just rejecting the attempt, you know, at the outset? I don't I don't think that's a fair critique. If you could point to a better attempt at dealing with, you know, whatever the definition of a nation, um, the definition, the use and definition of an older uh, way of thinking about ethnicity or whatever, like no one else is really trying to work with those concepts um, in that way. So I think it's it's pretty cheap to just say, well, it's it's definitely wrong because see Hitler, you know, I, I don't know. It's just pretty boring. So whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. Boring is a kind of key word there. Um, yeah. And I also so one of the things I wanted, I'm very kind of self-conscious of this. And I is this one reason why I talk about kind of the post-war period a lot is that we have certain habits of our mind that where even if it's even if what well, even if the idea we're proposing doesn't lead to something that Hitler did or something nasty in the 20th century uh, move like, you know, right wing or far, whatever we want to call these movements, um, mm -hmm. put a quarters. Uh, we we habitually then say, well, I'm not saying that we should be Nazis. I'm not saying we should mm -hmm. be fat fascist. I repudiate fascism and this and that. Yeah. You're really playing upon and reinforcing that habit to deny a bunch of stuff that doesn't actually follow from what you said originally, you know, like that is mm -hmm. the conservative mindset. It's like mm -hmm. you, you, you say, I want this policy. And all of a sudden you have to start saying, okay, I'm not a racist. I'm not xenophobic. I'm not this and that you have to start mm -hmm. listing everything's you're not. And so one of the reasons in is, was like, well, I'm not going to just right off the bat, start listing. I'm oh, of course I'd, I repudiate fascism and Nazism. When mm -hmm. if you read the if you read the the book, I, I don't affirm anything like sort of political mm -hmm. theory that would be Nazi. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. citing people uh, older, you know. So it's so I wasn't going to go run through that sort of game yeah. that conservatives play. And if that caused people, I think what happens, and I knew this has happened. I you know that that, it, that sort of thing causes conservatives to be uncomfortable. Like oh, he mentioned the word nationalism or mm -hmm. like ethnicity and he didn't like repudiate all forms of racism and all the, yeah. you know, it, it, there's that habit in the mind and I'm not going to play into that habit mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and reinforce it because I think we got to yeah. get away from that silly kind of that, that like, uh, yeah. That, yeah. It's, it's a contrived that. instinct. And, and it, when you, if you were to have done those things, you know, list your affirmations and denials, at the at the outset like a you know like a good boy is supposed to do then it, it does as you're saying reinforce and play into that mode of analysis and those those ideological um well they're, they're priors and they're, they're it's definitely right to call them values because they're really 
you know, it's it's to show you're you're the proper you're you have the proper moral standing uh, to then engage in things that might be, you know, dangerous to them or something. So you get those out in the open, and you'd probably still end up with the same accusations. They just because then yeah. they just call you a liar, you know. So yeah, um, it's fine. You're sneaking it in, um, but it's and it's also just dumb. I think it is. And speaking of historical analysis from Bill, like the you know. There, there's article. There were funny articles back before, like when Trump was first running, that were talking about like how no one can actually give a good def, like on the street, you know, or, or pundits, they can't really give a definition of fascism. Like it's just a word you just use yeah. for things that that make you uncomfortable and you don't like, and they seem overbearing or whatever, and no one actually knows. And then uh, I think this was actually like Foreign Policy magazine or something. There was a, it was called like the F word. I think was the the name of the article. And it went through like how how unique of a historical phenomenon Mussolini's Italy and Hitler's Germany were to the extent that you probably can't ever replicate them again. And there, you know, there might be a few examples that, that passed also within the 20th century, but it's not replicable because so many conditions, and that's like what fascism is. Like it's it's this thing, it's a it's a political social phenomenon of a particular time in, in history. And like in theory, in the you know in a sort of infinite universe, you could, you could replicate it, but it probably won't happen again. And so to keep saying that's fascist, this is fascist is the, art, the article, which was, this is not a conservative guy or anything was like, this is really dumb to just keep throwing around. Um, you know, it, it just makes no sense. I mean, you, if none of it really does. You can say someone's doing bad things without calling them a fascist or saying that their, their view of like government and political action is too robust or too muscular and overbearing, and they're still not doing a fascism. Like it's very, it's very unlikely that they're doing a fascism. Even these like not neo-Nazi LARPers or whatever in, in like Orlando, they're a. It's really unfair to call them. Not, I know they want to be Nazis and they may want to be fascists, but they're really neither because there's no category that exists for those those people. It's like saying I'm a Templar knight. Like, I, I'm just not because it doesn't exist. That we're, like, it, there's no yeah, yeah, yeah. there's no outlet for me to be that, uh, whether it's good or bad. Like, it just doesn't exist. So it's it's goofy and it's especially goofy to then be afraid of it. Like, if I got 200 people together and said we're all going to be, you know, Templars, uh, it, it's probably not a huge domestic or national security threat. Um, anyway, that's that's a big rabbit trail. But that's, it just frustrates yeah. me all the time that, that people deal with deal with things that dumb something could be bad you can disagree with something without needing to resort to like the ultimate trump card which is the real f word so anyway yeah yeah no i mean but that is the rhetoric of uh, our time which is to i don't i don't know if this was true in the past or not but uh but at least in our time that that's like you, the argument is nothing but saying that socialism or that's that's communism yeah. or um, you know, that's not conservative and it's, it's saying what it is, what it, and like, it's scary terminology. Mm -hmm. And so there's no actual argument. It's just mm -hmm. uh, trying to link it up with some, some term that's scary, but yeah, yeah. Or, 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 you know, or evil or wrong or whatever, but all right, all right, yeah. let's keep going here. Right, yeah, let's move. This issue, the best way to understand Christian nationalism in it's just barest sense is what's known as integralism. Integralism is ultimately this idea where we're going to have a mixing of the church and the state. And primarily what you're going to find is, is that you're going to see the state enforcing the church's laws on different matters. So that's a broad concept. But when you look at it historically and you look at integralist movements within the West, that's precisely what we find, whether it's with Constantine or you're going to find it within greater Europe. You even find this, ironically, within certain segments of, of Protestantism. You find Calvin doing it within Geneva. You even find it in, for example, we were in Boston recently. We took a vacation yeah, up there. All right, he's about to get into the yeah, annoying Quaker he's thing. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll keep that for Save sure. it for its own. Yeah. <laughs> so in integralism and in integralism. So you, you've used the term positively in the past. I yeah. don't like it just yeah. because I don't like the Roman Catholic integralists. And so I'm not yeah, going to yeah, say yeah. I am one. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I know you have, like, we both have thoughts on this, like the, the merging yeah. of church and state. One of the, pro one of the like frustrating things I'm sure like hearing that the merging of church and state mm -hmm. is just how imprecise that, that terminology yeah. is. Like in, in the later yeah. on, they'll say the founders, everyone affirmed a sort of separation between jurisdictions and church. Like, we're like, yeah, so do we. Yeah. Um, totally. So there's like this, 
Yeah. So when we say like do the reading or you don't know what you're talking yeah. about, this is the sort of thing we're talking about, like merging church yeah. and state. It, it's again, it's not precise. And if you understood our distinctions, you still may disagree. Mm -hmm. um, but at least we'd have we'd come to an understanding. Right. Yeah. I mean, of, of what yeah. we mean, we do believe in separate jurisdictions, separate powers or, you know, like separate swords, um, yeah. separate. Offices. Even the Roman Catholics can affirm all that. The yeah, Roman Catholic yeah, integralist yeah. would 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 agree with all that. That's what's hilarious is like the 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 real debate to have between the Roman Catholic integralist, you know, put, of course, has to do with the papacy and, and general ecclesiology and things. Um, but it, if you even if you didn't have the pope, let's just say the church and the, you know, the two powers, the temporal and spiritual, the two swords, the real debate you'd have between them is, is, um, is there a priority of one over the other? Is it a, is it a hierarchy? Are they parallel? Are they, to what extent and in what ways are they complementary? And uh, the, the mutual yeah. sort of diaconal role, those are all like the fun things to talk about that were actually, uh, you know, the Erastians debated in the 17th century. I mean, I know in your book, you use some um, Gillespie, you know, I think, I think his position is wins and is probably best reasoned in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so anyway, your, your debate and it gets, you know, those debates themselves got, got tedious and, um, but even the Erastians are saying like, we're not trying to subvert church, church discipline or steal the keys of the church. We're just, this is for the sake of civil order, you know, baptism or, or rather the Lord's supper is so important, you know, to, discipline people with that is not good. You know, it's these sort of complicated arguments in the weeds, but they're, they're not there. No one is merging church and state into one unit, even if you have as an Erastian or, or you know, British Protestant generally accept the king as as a certain kind of head of the church. No one's no one's saying, uh, you know, that the keys uh, to the church, that its powers being taken and and uh, subverted by the by the civil power, any of those things. I mean, even as I said, the the best kind of Roman Catholic integralist today, who are all drawing off nineteenth century stuff. You know, uh, Peter Waldstein and and Thomas Pink at King's College London, I think, are the best guys to read on that. You'll see that they don't do that. Their thing is just well, but I think the the church is supreme, and the, there should be a certain kind of of deference from the state to the church. And I've argued there's a certain kind of deference. It's just different than the way they do it. And so that's why for a while I was playing around with that label. I'm still fine with it, but, you know, it didn't really catch on, whatever. Um, but the, the point is you can have a really interesting debate with lots of distinctions and different models could emerge that we might even be able to come to some agreement on. But when you just do this thing and you talk about they want to merge church and state, we want to keep them separate. That's not an interesting debate. Yeah, I, I have the sense that they they both want to, in a way, say that the that, that when when they when they talk about like like you mentioned church laws, which I'm guessing could refer to like the like the first table sort of laws. I have, I have then, no idea. Yeah. And, and then the so like the the state should enforce first like the Christian laws, which would be like I guess first table uh, sort of laws. I mean, really, in it, like in itself, blasphemy laws with regard to like atheism and polytheism are actually not distinctively Christian. So there's, I think there's yeah. things break down uh, along those lines. Um, so I, I think they want to say that the, the state has no um, in principle, no jurisdictions over things that concern religious life or religious actions, which I guess mm -hmm. we can, can be include, which extends to someone denying religion or denying God. And so that's what yeah. that's what that's what they how they want to make the, that distinction, um, like yeah. which we which we would say like historically that's not the case in America. That they'll mm -hmm. get into the fact they'll assume this is like the American experiment is precisely mm -hmm. along those lines when it's mm -hmm. when it's really not. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I just don't, I don't get the sense that either of them kind of know what our position would be. Yeah. And they assume that their that their position, which I, I think as I I might have like steel manned it a little bit for them, uh, <laughs> is like the only acceptable position. So that there is yeah. no like the civil power has no jurisdiction over outward relig religious expression unless it somehow violates the second table. So no child sacrifice, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which which uh you know, which is historic. I mean, he, he was saying earlier he wants this to be a historical argument. I mean, there's even 
interesting issues there because I assume both of them, as with most Americans, are not even going to blink at the fact that the the state has things to say in our society now about marriage. And I don't even mean just with like the gay marriage issue, but but marriage generally it has jurisdiction, regulation of marriages, those things. There are certain um, places in in history and Western history could be dropped down where that would not be the, the case, right? That would be a purely ecclesial jurisdiction and it would be considered um, a sort of um, theft by the by this temporal power to, to try to singularly regulate those without any kind of interaction with the church. So it's like, this is not the only model you could have. And there, there's, there's a debate you could have on that if, if you think it's so cut and dry, um, but you want it to be historically informed, it's going to become less um, less cut and dry as you go, which forces you to actually talk about in principle, you know, you know what what's acceptable to define the uh, the terms you're using. And I'm sure that you know I'm sure that some of this they would say the distinctions we're making are distinctions without a difference. That just if you think um, you know the the state has any kind of religious interest whatsoever, it's carrying water for the church. Therefore, you've effectively merged them. Which I again I think is sloppy, but I'm sure that. In, in some ways, that's what they're they're thinking that there's it's not as it's not as um, there's not enough separation between the two or a distinction. Yeah. And I, I think another thing is that like for for our position, I, I, th I think you have the same position that the mm -hmm. there the, the state or the civil power has an, it ha can can touch upon things like external mm -hmm. things that would be religious yeah. uh, because that's actually good for society. Like it's. Mm -hmm. Like, if, like if let's say that like the primary interests of civil power are the outward things of the second table. Well, if you want those people to flourish with regard to, to civil mm -hmm. virtue, you also need piety. And I, mm -hmm. and I mean, we'll get into the founders in a little bit, but uh, the, the, it was pretty much universally recognized. And Mark David Hall mm -hmm. has shown this, that there is mm -hmm. that like, even Madison would affirm that, yeah, you need a sort of religious Christian Protestant people mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to uh, to to ensure that there will be these sort of civic virtues in society. And so yeah. that's why a lot of people, including like Washington and others and, mm -hmm. and John Adams and George Mason, all these guys would would see the need for some kind of civil involvement in religion mm -hmm. because there was a state. There was an interest in I mean, apart mm -hmm. from like supporting the eternal good that is like mm -hmm. ordering to the highest good, there's an interest simply in the the earthly goods. Yeah. Yeah, the religious, religious people are happier people. The religious yeah. people are going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, follow the 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 second table mm -hmm. more or, mm -hmm. or better, right? Yeah, yeah, and you could do that even if you're just saying limiting the state's interest to the second table, which which neither of us would, but you could still get there in a certain way. Um, and it's even uh, there it was, you know, so two things. The you see this, and I, I mentioned this the other night on the spaces. I've, I've mentioned. It seems like a million times now, but when you read, because this is something they're concerned about, you know, blasphemy law cases that are American cases, the the justification for upholding the enforcement by the court is always on the on the basis of civil order of you know it's it's disruptive and and bad for social cohesion when the majority religion is maligned publicly and we're we're Christian people therefore you know you have it, it's almost just it's just a fact of life to them. It's not even really something to be debated. It's just their expectation for social order necessarily includes a religious element because the people are religious. It is Christian, both historically and presently. Therefore, the civil order, or the, the, the temporal power has a civil interest in maintaining tranquility in that regard, which means you can't go around saying bad things openly about it. Um, it's not an absolute restriction on, on speech and things, but it is a restriction. And there's a, there's a, we could say purely civil interest being exerted there, which I'd be, you know, I think you can go further, but I'd be perfectly happy with that argument. Um, I think it's sufficient in many ways to, to do what we're talking about, but so they, I don't even, you know, think uh, Bill and, and Jenna have maybe familiar with it, with that aspect or, or those categories and those, those sources. Um, but, but that's the better conversation to have. Yeah. And I, I yeah. And I, Another another key distinction is that we're we're not saying that the 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 um the, the gospel uh as a sort of um 
I don't know. I was, I was going to say product of grace. I don't think that's, that's not, that's fine. That's fine. As a sort of like, you know, a product of grace, we're not saying that, that the gospel itself commands civil magistrates to be like its enforcement of the gospel itself. So we're not, mm -hmm. we're not because like the gospel and it's, you know, the, the, the spiritual administration of word and sacrament mm -hmm. is, uh, is deposited with the church and mm -hmm. uh, with established ministers. They're the ones who do all that. They're the ones who, um, you know, facilitate the worship of God, that they're the ones who offer the things of the spiritual things of sacred and eternal life. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but what we're, what we're saying is that the, the civil power can still operate out of these, this, this sort of natural mm -hmm. power that it has. I'll say it's like, a, it's natural in the sense that it flows from their duty to the good of the people. Mm -hmm. And that good includes uh, eternal or the highest good. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, we're not saying that this is like a new command. We're not saying that. Yeah, we're, we're saying this is an original old uh, kind of duty of the civil power to uh, order people in, in, in that way. Yeah. So it's not like a new like adventitious command of God from the gospel. It's mm -hmm. something in some ways I think it's, I think you say it's pre gospel. It's mm -hmm. natural. And then the application. So the of the thing, thing, yeah. yeah. So the the. Um, the application of grace that that is the uh, uh the reason why they ought to promote and secure and and uh, and, and support the true or christianity is because it's mm -hmm. the true religion like that's the, their mm -hmm. obligation mm -hmm. as civil power is to promote the true religion which is christianity yeah, yeah. Um, so again it's a natural principle it's a natural power of civil government that's fulfilled in light of grace mm -hmm. that's how i've, I've always right. explained that way no, I think I think that's right, and I would I would say I mean again I've said this other places, so I kind of like bore myself with it at this point. But it clearly doesn't it doesn't <laughs> stick. Yeah. But like, so if you know if you're governing, and th and this gets to your point of it's just in the nature of the things and the nature of the office, um, which which predates you know the the um, full announcement you know the gospel and the ministry of, of of Christ. So it's just in the nature of the things. It's also not abrogated by. Uh, the gospel right. either right. so it's just there um just as much as like the nature of marriage isn't changed these natural relations that mm -hmm. that um that also as if, if you read you know older texts that we're interested in they're always very quick even in the 18th century too to say you know you can uh, this is these are truths when we're dealing it with them at this level that um good good pagan governments will exercise you will see them there mm -hmm. right so this is just in the nature of the thing um my favorite is William Prynne on that, where he's just like, um, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is is doing everything right. He's just wrong about what religion is true, but his function is being performed appropriately when he, yeah. when he deals with blasphemy and idolatry. And every well-ordered government does that. Now you just need to recognize the true religion because you have a duty to not promote idolatry and falsehood on your own at scale. And so you have to now pursue. That's where the duty to to support uh, the true religion, which is expressed in the church. You can't do it on your own because you don't have that office. So that's why you protect the church so it can do its mission. And it's yeah. good for society. It's good for civil order. Um, but it also is incumbent upon you because you receive your power from God to be honorable to him by promoting only true things. So it all, you know, kind of coheres and goes together. And I think it, it, it makes sense to me. It seems very simple. Um, and I do agree. It's just, it's, as I already said, it's just embedded in the nature that, of these things. You don't even, I mean, I think there are certain texts that are used over and over again in the, in the tradition to talk about some of this, you know, nursing fathers and mothers, what, what have you, but um, it's just a sort of metaphysical argument almost from, from these aspects of given certain uh, prior metaphysical realities, then, you know, X, Y, Z increasingly has to become the case. Um, so if the nature, you know, you begin with your anthropology and move on, you arrive at some of these conclusions that are also attested yeah. to in the, in the tradition as well. So, yeah, I mean, this is why you'll, you'll see Calvin, Turretin, um, Althusius, others. This mm -hmm. is why they're, they're appealing to, uh, Plato. So Plato's laws said that atheism should not be tolerated. Mm -hmm. Uh, Aristotle says yeah. there should be support for sacred offices, sacred buildings, Mm -hmm. um, Cicero talks about, I forget exactly what Cicero says, but something along the lines of mm -hmm. supporting, you know, religion, mm -hmm. uh, and, and all these guys are cited over and over, even like Grotius cites them, mm -hmm. uh, and just, uh, over and over and over and over cited these guys. And, and why would they cite these people? I mean, obviously there was mm -hmm. no, there was no salvific grace with these 
pagan authors, mm -hmm. the reason they cite those people is because they're operating out of something that's mm -hmm. pre-grace, pre-political, -pre or uh, mm -hmm. sorry, pre-grace pre, uh, pre, uh, and pre-gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and then those principles that nature properly applied because of mm -hmm. the gospel and because of Christianity's true religion ought to be for Christianity. So yeah, that's, um, that, that's why I think it's weird when like the, the two kingdoms guys don't take mm -hmm. an account of that argument. They want to talk about natural law, natural law, this and that. Yeah. Yeah. Like why is the tradition appealing to pagans? Well, because mm -hmm. they're accessing mm -hmm. the, the, the natural law that orders people to worship. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I don't I don't know if this is exactly true, but you see this in certain um, I don't know if it's, it's exactly true about contemporary treatment of the reformers and on these questions. But you're going to see this in a lot of the historical work on uh, on the founders in the 18th century will kind of treat their treat it as, it, it, you know, it's almost to like diminish their their intellect and, their, and things It'll almost treat like the citations to um, classical sources as like window dressing to just kind of say like it's almost convention, you kind of need to do it this way, instead of the fact that they were actually compelling and proved something and carried weight. And and it was a, you know, we were talking earlier about we, we don't, we're not able to have a conversation or debate with certain people about these things, because we don't have a common uh, bank of source material or common language intellectually. And, um, and, you know, the, the people still did in the 18th century. So you can just, you'll, I mean, you know, this from reading, especially 17th century sources, um, sometimes they're difficult because they'll make certain allusions to classical things, source material, whatever, that you're just expected to pick up on immediately. So their citations will be kind of meager and you've really got to track them down and, mm -hmm. and make sure you know what they're referring to and like how they're, they're using it because it was just so common. It's almost like rudimentary. And uh, even as some of, uh, for our purposes, those same sources will be um, I'm trying to think of a good one that's really terse at the beginning. It's not Vermeule. He does a good job. Anyway, some of them will be so terse at the beginning that you, you feel like you're missing something. It's probably because they don't want to waste their time on things that everybody should just know. So you can just dive right into the deep end, right, and, and get something going. Uh, you, some of the election sermons, you'll see this. Just things stated summarily. And it's because mm -hmm. no one and no one would have disagreed with it. And it's it's just getting you up to speed of like where we're, where we're going to get anyway. Yeah. There, there, well, on, yeah. on the election sermon, this, yeah, there, yeah. I think yeah, and you've probably read it. There's a, I think it's Davenport did a, an election yeah. sermon and, and uh, it's 70, interesting. like or 71. Yeah. 1670 or 71. I think okay. this is, okay. <laughs> yeah. of course. Yeah. You know this, but I mean, <laughs> well, I, I remember that it was, uh, I, I was reading like Rutherford's Lex Rex and then I read yeah. that sermon for, I think for my dissertation or something like that. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that's like, it's, he's like quoting, yeah. you know, without attribution, he's quoting right, Rutherford. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So, I'm I mean, gonna, that's I probably plagiarism more than anything. <laughs> but, <laughs> right, but, uh, right. I was uh, 69. Okay, so I was, I was close. Yeah, it was a good one. I used it because it has natural law in it and all that. Like, law yeah, law it's, law in it, so it's good. It's a really for good my project. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's very good. I would, I would, I think I've commended that to people elsewhere. I mean, I, I like Davenport a lot, even even though he, uh, well, you know, he's kind of, he plagiarized a lot of stuff because he steals, you know, who knows if he wrote it or Cotton wrote it on the, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. The who, discourse, who right? We are, that was like our first yeah. argument on a, on a podcast was about, yeah, that. this is like inside baseball now, but <laughs> anyway, sorry. That goes back to the old days. The, 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 old the days, days that are now past, though, those, yes. Are, <laughs> um, so the, the, the world, that world no longer exists, unfortunately. It doesn't just argue yeah. over And election. nobody can deny that the Puritans, did some of these things when they first colonized the United States of America. And we make the distinction between those who initially colonized the United States of America and what actually became our United States Constitution. And let me give you an example so of what this looks dis like. Discontinuity um, between people. When yes, you're there, yes, you yes, have yes. this statue of a woman named Mary Dyer. And Mary Dyer oh, yeah, was a woman who go. came over as a Puritan. <laughs> but she would go back and forth between the United States and England and while she was away at one point in time, she converted to Quakerism. And if you know anything about the relationship between Quakers and Puritans, they didn't get along because they differed over things such as divine special revelation, as it relates to almost like a charismatic concept of divine revelation given to them, over the ordination of women, over a variety of different things. Well, Mary came back to Boston well, and she started hosting <laughs> yeah. Quaker meetings. And during this time, <laughs> Mary actually became pregnant 
wearing clothes and in she miscarried the child. And these Puritans were saying to her, well, you miscarried the child because of your conversion to Quakerism. And they ended up passing all of these laws banning Quakerism. And she was hung in the Boston Commons for being a Quaker. And she's gone down as a hallmark now of what it really means to have religious freedom in the United States of America. So when we look at this... So that there are the, the myths of what of of 17th century New England yeah. Puritanism are just astounding, and yeah. uh, and so part of my dissertation was partly on this. So I'm an expert. Yes. No, um, but uh, <laughs> but what, what's interesting is like the Puritans were dealing with this sort of these sort of claims even back then. Like there was a pattern. Yeah. So you know there was like the, yeah. there was like um, Roger Williams, Antinomians, mm -hmm. then and then mm -hmm. Quakers. Uh, I mean Quakers all the time. And then yeah. eventually the Baptist issue kind of came to head in like the late 60s mm -hmm. and early 70s mm -hmm. and all that. Um, in each case, what's interesting is like in each case, there's a pattern. Like there's a pattern overall. It's that the the New England authorities suppress these this, you know, dissidents in some fashion. They mm -hmm. go back to England, write a book, mm -hmm. and then that book is circulated. And everyone's like, whoa, look what New England's are. This is crazy. These people are persecuting, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then you have the New England authorities saying, no, that's not what happened at all. <laughs> right. It happened right. over and over. So first with, with, um, with the antinomians, John, yeah. John Winthrop did this. He wrote something yeah. called a short, short story. I forget what the title is. He did that. He uh, responded yeah. to this. History, he was, um, yeah. And then, of course, there was Cotton responding to Roger Williams before that. And then later on, you have with the Baptists, you have um, once all the controversy with the Baptists kind of came to a head or you know climax, I guess. Uh, you had uh, um, my, my, my boy uh, Samuel Willard writing <laughs> a piece that explained what happened and with increased Mather writing a preface. Uh, so yeah. this pattern happened over and over. And it's like the, the 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 claims of the, quote, persecuted are the ones that won out. And um, yeah. we, so the, and then created these myths that we have today instead of actually dealing with what actually happened on the ground. So, right, um, right. Well, the, yeah, we have, okay, we have to get the title right on Winthrop. It's a short story of the rise, reign, and ruin of the antinomians. Okay, there you go, yeah. <laughs> and the libertine and the familist. Yeah, yeah, familist, yeah, there it, anyway, there it is. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, this is actually why, it, well, it's part of the story of why they lose their original charter when Charles II comes back, because when he gets back, there's, there's probably ulterior motives for Charles to do this at the time. Um Dealing, dealing with the wars of the Dutch and debt and everything, but something he has like on his desk, essentially, we can think of it that way. When he comes back into Whitehall is like on his desk is this, you know, very fantastical account by Quakers published in London of what's happening. And he's like, oh my goodness, you know, this has, to, and the Quakers are a convenient constituency for him, of course. So he, he says, I'm going to give the, you know, we've got to put a stop to this. It's against uh, you know, the new laws at the time of England and all, so it gets them in high, and then they end up losing, you know, we have consolidation of the colonies, whatever, and a, an actual tyrannical situation. But with the Quakers too, I mean, if we want to be accurate, you and I have probably talked about this before publicly somewhere, I can't remember, but like, I'm pretty hard on the Quakers and I don't have a lot of sympathy for 17th century Quakers in these scenarios because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we they think of them as be, they were nuts. Yeah. So, I mean, so was Roger Williams. They're like, yeah, all, yeah. These, all these he guys are nut, nuts. Yeah. Um, and they they did things. So it's not just that they're nutty. And it's not really the theological issues. I mean, you had you had a great um, quote you were sharing with me the other day from John Cotton talking about, you know, the, the uh, essentially the myth of, of how they think of religious liberty in, mm -hmm. in Massachusetts Bay at the time. He's like, that's not what we do. We're not persecuting belief. We're not terrorizing people. We're not doing any of that. Like people don't uh, have to be, we're not forcing them into church. Like we're not doing that uh, in this way. So, but the, the point is like the Quakers were there and there's writings from them on this to make like an intentional spectacle, right? They come to Massachusetts Bay essentially as missionaries. That's how they see themselves. And they're coming back, you know, they'll come through Rhode Island then up uh, once Rhode Island's established up to Massachusetts and to Boston. And part of their missionary, uh, you know, approach is to essentially wreak havoc by one, they're, they're of course going to intentionally violate the, the laws against preaching certain things in public, but they also would like spit on the ministers and the magistrates and they would like yeah. disrupt church services naked and like throw, I think there was one case where they were throwing broken bottles at like the, the preacher and, you know, all this stuff. 
And so eventually the, the magistrates are kind of like, well, I mean, you, you can chalk it up to essentially just the civil order argument we made earlier of like, you cannot have this. It's very well, disruptive yeah. and the people don't want it. Right. Yeah. And I think that there's a, I think Samuel Sowell has a, 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 yeah. a diary, you know, he has the, the diaries, yeah. the two volume diary you can pick up. There's an entry yep. of a Quaker woman who rushes into the church naked yeah. in blackface. Okay. She's yeah. nude yeah. with blackface yeah. babbling and screaming and calling everyone heretics and, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, so there's more to it than this. So uh, yeah. like, like the way Bill approaches it, it's like, oh, she showed up and she mm -hmm. was just a humble little woman who mm -hmm. um, and who was just doing a Bible study and they pulled her out and they hung her and killed her. OK, right. <laughs> but to understand what the Quakers yeah. is the w when they finally did hang, I think they did. They, they hang like two or th maybe three or four of them. They let three some others four. go. Yeah. 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 And she yeah. was one of them. But these people were banished like three or four times to back. Yeah. To oh, that's right. That's right. Or yeah. they actually, so basically the, the new England would say, you guys are nuts. You're mm -hmm. crazy. You're disruptive. You're awful. Yeah. You're getting on that ship. You're going back yeah. three, two, three months later or whatever, they'd come back and they do the same yeah. thing over again. They yeah. put them on the ship, send them back. Yeah. Or they, they go down to Virginia yeah. Uh, or other colonies, those colonies be like, get that yeah, out of yeah, here. Yeah, right. Then they leave yeah. there, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, and they faster. come back to New England. And it's like, yeah. what are you people doing? And so yeah. in the end, they they did pass like they did pass a law. Yeah. After like the third or fourth time, they're like, okay, if you come back, we're gonna kill you. Yeah. We're like, we're gonna execute you. And then there was, I think it was like the second or third time. Then they passed the law and then a bunch of people came back and they said, okay, yeah. we'll be lenient. We won't apply the law to you. Yeah. If you come back again, we're going to apply the law to you. Yeah. Sure enough, they come back and do their same yeah. nonsense again. And so it's yeah. like, I, I get like, it looks like it's religious liberty persecution, Yeah. but that's yeah. not what happened. Like that's, that's it, it's, yeah. it's like nuts who are crazy and won't take a hint. And then they just said, I, I, and maybe in the end, like, you know, executing was wrong, but it's, it's not simply this narrative of this right. humble woman That's shows up with the Bible study and has her kid and, yeah. Oh, how dare you be Quaker? We're going to kill you. Like, that's not at all right. what happened. And none of that even happened. That didn't happen with Roger Williams. That didn't happen no. with the antinomians. It didn't happen with, with the Baptists. Um, each of those stories is unique. Um, yeah. But but still, none of that like, narrative of like the the Puritans breaking down the door of these humble you know law abiding right. people, um, right? That, were, none of those narratives are actually accurate. I mean, there's pretty good evidence that they the the Puritans throughout their their control of Massachusetts were aware that you know in the western part of the the colony especially you know that there were antinomians, uh, Anabaptist Quakers and even witches running around, not, not bothering anybody. Like they were out there and right. it was fine. You know, they're not, they're not marching around to go find the, a heathen to kill just because that they like, like doing that sort of thing. Yeah. If I and may just like cite a source for that, like John Cotton yeah. says that maybe you're about yeah. to, I just stole your thunder. There. No, no, no. That's John, no John Cotton says that explicitly. It's like, Hey, okay, yeah. so we control like Boston and Salem and these other places. Yeah. yeah. And, but we don't, yeah. Like he's like, we don't go out and, yeah. go find a bunch of heretics in the woods and, and round them up. Yeah. Uh, this was part of the appeal of the Baptists. It's like, okay, yeah. the, the, the congregationalists were like, okay, we left, we came here, we established a sort of civil order that uh, with our civil, our, our, um, our church state relations, it was our intent. Yeah. You come here, we will receive mm -hmm. you if you conform to our church state relations. Don't bother us. Don't start your own churches. You yeah. can be part of our churches, which like mm -hmm. that was uh, they were accepted, as you know, they were accepted into churches as long as they mm -hmm. would not be crazy. Um, and then when like in like when Increase Mather and, and Willard write this reply, they're like, why did you come here? Like if it would be wrong, like this, the congregationalists are like saying it would be wrong of us to say, oh, there's this Baptist colony down in, I don't know, wherever. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. go there and become our congregationalists and disrupt right. and, and this and that. They'd be like, yeah. why? Like, that would be wrong for us to do. Why are you doing yeah. that here? And if yeah. you want to go found your own anti pedo Baptist colony, then go right ahead and go go yeah. ahead and do it. We're not going to bother space. you. We're not going to start an army and say, let's go drown the Baptists. Like, right. So, anyway. Right. Yeah. Which is, 
No, it's well, it's it's frustrating because it's it's. I mean, it'd be one thing if it was just like a a nerdy interest we had, but it does get trotted out all the time, like pretty frequently in these debates we've been having today over the past couple of years. It does get trotted out a lot. So and it's and yeah. it's trading on the same myths that have been. Uh, if people do the reading, have <laughs> been refuted not only by the primary sources themselves at the time, but then you could check those and say, okay, was that actually true or is this pure polemics? And it's been demonstrated. Um, I mean, I think it's your, another one is, I think it is your boy, Sam, Samuel Willard, who writes the Anabaptist, I've cited this one before, of like they're complaining, you know, this, this colony is supposed to be for religious liberty and you won't give us the full franchise. And they were like, what are you talking about? Like, we're here to, <laughs> like that's really weird Willard, to yeah, say. Yeah, okay. um, like, you can go do that somewhere else. There's plenty of land, but we're doing it here. Yeah. We've been doing it a while. We're pretty successful. We we want it to be this way. We we welcome anybody who will join in with like our, our type of society. And if you don't want to, then you go somewhere else, but please don't bother us. I mean, I think, and to show that they weren't just, you know, heartless kind of, bloodthirsty guys. I mean, I think it's, I think Winthrop is the one who warns Williams when they're going to, they're going to send him to London. They're going to send him back, put him on a ship. And, you know, he had all these connections in London anyway. And I think Winthrop is like writes him and says, Hey, we're, get, we're getting ready to send you back to London. So if you don't want that to happen, like you could just go down to the, what's now Rhode Island and hang out there and you'll be out of the jurisdiction and you could do that. And that's what he did. So it's, you know, it was kind of like as the governor at the time was like, you know, we can do two things. You can you can leave one of two ways and you know knock yourself out. Um, anyway, the the point is it's always more complicated and and so just using it the way Bill Roach does here is a uh, is, is kind of a joke. Um, and then to also make we we can get into this too the continuity discontinuity thing mm -hmm. of uh, you know is it so as if you transported a, a whole new people unconditioned by the the previous 150 years into 1776 and then you know by 87 89 boom you know here here's your constitutional order with no no background no influence yeah. even though uh again if you do the reading you know like <laughs> one of one of samuel adams's favorite pen names is uh you know suits is I like to say is the first non account in america he had like 25 different names uh was the puritan right and he was very proud of like his puritan heritage you know, he calls famously calls Boston a Christian Sparta or that's what he wants it to be. Uh, he thinks there's there's massive continuity and that that's part of the reason he is then an anti-federalist and, and sort of uh, contrary to John Adams, you know, sides more with that positioning uh, than, than the federalist positioning at the time. So it but to him, it's a certain consciousness he cares. And, and by the way, he called himself the Puritan because his contemporaries called him the last Puritan like he was known to be religiously zealous oh, really? you know, for, okay. know for his um for his his uh heritage it's not just a religion he's very orthodox it seems but it's not just that like he's very proud of his parents and things so it's like there's extreme continuity and they think they're defending a way of life that predates you know what they then then establish and that's the whole point so it's really weird to say there's this you know history starts over it's like a grand reset and has nothing to do with you know they would have been our founders would have been super embarrassed by Massachusetts in the 1660s. It's like, well, no, they kind of thought it was, they kind of wanted to preserve a lot of it. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, he, but he, I think he recognized that he kind of has to do that, make that move. Uh, right. Because, yeah. Yeah. Because if, because he wants to say that we, we, we want to jump back into the 17th century New England and that's, that violates the founding founding principles because there's, so there's an utter break and another thing i wanted to mention is cotton mather so cotton mather is mm -hmm. he's writing in like the around 1701 what is it magnolia christiana to that kind of history yeah. of new england yep. mm -hmm. he has a section on persecution he's kind of famous for mm -hmm. uh somewhat repudiating some of the past like you know actions against people and he, he thought they mm -hmm. were un unnecessary he didn't like how they treated the baptists except he thought that the way they treated the Quakers was justified. Like he actually yeah. says they yeah. were nuts. I mean, pretty much. And he says yeah. that, you know, I, he said, I'll defend my four, my, my, uh, my forefathers all, all day long mm -hmm. when it comes to the Quakers. And uh, mm -hmm. so that that's from Cotton Mather, who was kind of a bridge builder with the Baptists as well uh, in his own uh, about 15 years yeah. later. Yeah. Uh, so no, that's right. Anyway, But I, yeah. I think, like, I think Cotton Mather is like, I, I use him, you know, in my dissertation. I think Cotton Mather is kind of the sort of bridge in a way, perhaps, yeah. or he's in, he's he, he in, 
is indicative of a move towards greater religious toleration uh, towards the Baptists. And yeah, so I, I think there's continuity. I've argued that many times, and mm -hmm. and I think and and, and uh, our our friends are also on that side. And but yeah, yeah. Uh, do I mean we can? Yeah, I think they'll get no, to the founding, so we can move on. We can keep going. <laughs> okay. Unless yeah, you yeah. have something else. No, I was just I, I echo the uh, the point on Mather on Cotton Mather. Uh, I wrote I wrote something a little while ago. Just just only looking at his. So I didn't bring in the Magnalia, but the. Uh, just his, some of his public sermons that are like more political. So they're all to general assemblies for various reasons. And you can even from that construct that same narrative you're talking about. I mean, I, I basically say he's um, he's kind of the first American in this regard because he's he paints a vision of, of the pan-Protestant union that you kind of have. Um, and that's what I think he he wanted. He talks about it explicitly. It is more of this toleration for Protestants. It comes out of this, you know, that, United Brethren kind of effort overseas that was before that he was really him and increase were fans of they're making sense of like the new charter, all this stuff. So he preaches on this over and over again. I think it's, I think it's four or five times. Um, and he is, you know, post 1689 is like going, going that direction with everybody and kind of pushing it there um, and saying like, we can, we can agree on the, but again, that that'll get us to later religious Liberty stuff of like the scope of that and, that sort of thing where I think there's extreme continuity to the, to what you're saying and uh, what you get at the founding, which is, uh, you know, not that much longer later, like, you know, Cotton Mather knew Ben Franklin. So it's not like, it's pretty, it's pretty tight timeline. Uh, yeah. So to say there's no continuity would be strange just on its face, but I think you, you do have it in this regard. Um, and I, I think that's fair to say singularly that the Cotton Mather uh, as you put a bridge, it was sort of bridge. I think that's, that's right. That makes sense to me. Okay. Yeah. I, I love to read those sermons. I'm not aware of those, but that's good. You should put that on. I'll have to get it on the resources. Yeah. yeah. I wrote and a really long a resourcement project. I wrote a really long piece in American former called why cotton Mather was like talking about our fellowship name. And that's where I do this breakdown of these sermons, but I need to, I need to put them out so everyone can just read them. Um, I do a pretty long breakdown of them. It's, it's, it might be like, 8,000 words or something, but anyway, okay. uh, people can go bore themselves with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, let's, let's, let's do more. Bill. This. We've done like eight minutes, but that's fine. I mean, <laughs> I, I can talk as long as if you get tired and want to go fine. away, we can just shut it off whenever. <laughs> yeah. okay. When we see we'll sort this. of the, the, the Puritan ideal put okay. on the American okay. soil, okay. it led to the death of people like Mary Dyer. So regardless of what kind of definition they want to give, we know what they're actually doing with the Christian nationalism. They're enforcing these blasphemy laws from the state in an integralist sense to silence those who oppose them. So in that sense, it's a denial of freedom of speech and the freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think, uh, Bill... It All right, do you want to talk about this now then? <laughs> well, yeah. It <laughs> I mean, we kind of already already did with Blatt, like the the rationale for blasphemy laws, or. But I think well, let's let's figures. deal with like like you you know let's, the constitutional history better than sure. anyone, yeah. right? So on blasphemy laws, better than anyone, I don't know. Yeah, better than anyone, but well, I guess <laughs> yeah. probably more than anyone listening. So let's just you, you okay, can you can play it off as the. What do we have? Yeah. There but we I mean, but as everyone kind of knows, uh, well. Oh, okay, as everyone should know, that there were blasphemy laws in this country for, for uh, you know, in, in different counties and states mm -hmm. uh, across the country for many years, for decades, decades, centuries, even yeah. into, even I think today there are blasphemy laws just not enforced. I don't right. remember. I, I think there was a court case in the 1920s that affirmed them, uh, but this is maybe you know all these things. But but the yeah. fact of the matter is like the, the um, idea. Yeah, I will. I mean. Well, yeah. let's, before we get speci specifically blasphemy laws, we should point out, like, you know, it's people say this all the time is that there were softest, I call them soft establishments in the, mm -hmm. in the founding era and beyond that yeah. the, even, even Roger Sherman, people don't know him, but he was yep. one of the, uh, he helped craft the first amendment, which includes religion mm -hmm. causes. And he, uh, he, he was responsible with another guy to, to kind of revise the, Connecticut state code or, or, or the law, mm -hmm. the laws. And in, in that included the civil support for, I mean, it, the, it recognized the right of conscience, but also mm -hmm. that there ought to be some kind of civil support for uh, religion. And mm -hmm. there was that condi condition that if 
you can peacefully assemble for your worship as long as you're peaceful. That that sort of proviso mm -hmm. you see all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so there were people within. I mean, he's just one example. Uh, yeah. The Bill almost wants to take like the the like the like Madisonian approach, which I think would be, mm -hmm. which is the which was the minority position uh, at yeah. the time, which yeah. was an utter separation. And people have commented how Madison's view went even farther than Locke's. Like Locke mm -hmm. said mm -hmm. atheists and Roman Catholics shouldn't have, shouldn't be tolerated. Madison's right. just like, yeah, everyone. Um, right. Whereas, uh, and or not, not just toleration, but also a strict separation. Yeah. Uh, wh yeah. Whereas people like George Washington, George Mason, um, John Adams, mm -hmm. um, uh, like, you know, Roger Sherman, uh, mm -hmm. even um, like these people would say that you need to have, it's good to have some kind of, civil involvement in religion in a positive way that is mm -hmm. uh, providing uh, money to um, to to re religious uh, to, to churches and ministers that's mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. so, anyway. yeah it's it's like interesting the uh you know to we when you're talking about the scope of some of these things of religious li liberty at the and toleration at the the founding like i think the most the loosest of the original state constitutions on this point is probably New York in, in 77, I think they are, where they don't, they have a, an article, um, a paragraph on the right of conscience, and then they don't have one for establishment, right? They don't have, I mean, New York's always been like the most cosmopolitan, it's changed from Dutch to British hands and all this stuff. So you have a, it's, it's very much a religious melting pot to some degree already. Um, but they do have an article then right after that that's that's all on why specifically it says ministers of the gospel. It doesn't just say like anybody who thinks they're, you know, they went online and they can like perform weddings now. It's like a minister of the gospel should not simultaneous, simultaneously serve in religious and civil office because it will obstruct or, or distract from um, the ministry of God to the people for their religious good, something like that. And so the point is, there's you don't have an establishment in that state, although a lot of other ones you did, and you're you are introducing there a bit of a set that was not an uncommon, uh, as you know, in colonial America. I mean, the, the Puritans actually had a law saying you couldn't do this either, be a clergy and serve uh, in the legislature. Um, but they're doing that. But it's the scope of it is obviously Christianity, you know, minister of the gospel. It's it's yeah. de facto Protestant, and the separation that's introduced is justified. On the basis that it would uh, that really the ministry of the gospel is higher than that of, of of the civil, right? Which is which is so it's it's a law that, you know for the preservation of the church is why it's produced um, of the church is. Yeah. So you have that you know that's the most liberal really of the time. I mean, you have all these tests for offices, even mm -hmm. uh, Tennessee's original constitution, which is after. Um, afterwards, you know, there's no establishment, but they still have religious tests for offices that are all Christian, uh, explicitly Christian, Trinitarian, all this. So it, uh, we all know that. I mean, the, all the state constitutional data that paints a very different picture, it tells you a lot. There are consensus documents, like what's going on at the ground. So even we don't even have to like line up all the, the founders of like the names we know. We know yeah. that Jefferson and Madison and Thomas Paine, of course, are outliers. Historians say this. It's not just like our assessment. It's, it's very obvious. They're total outliers, but then on top of that, you can look at more, um, you could call it like social history data or something, which constitutions are better examples of, um, of what's going on on the ground, like what's life like at the time uh, socially. And um, what do most people kind of think? What are they okay with? What are they, um, and those state constitutions do that for you. They show you what the general consensus opinion is at the time. Uh, there's some diversity, but it's generally towards certainly, um, you know, establishmentarian um, principles, even if some of it's more soft, like you're saying, or more diversified. Um, once again, the Quakers basically had an establishment because they were they were like politically active at one time. Yeah. <laughs> they controlled Philadelphia. So all of this conf conflicts with this simple narrative of separations introduced. And, you know, it's not really uh, Jenna and Bill's fault, I guess, because even even see this in like Supreme Court cases, you know, the they cite the remonstrance. They cite, um, you know, some something something from Virginia, and maybe a, a letter or two, and then boom, there's your your narrative. Um, yeah, I mean, Mark so. David Hall, who's a political, essentially historian. I guess he's technically a political political theorist, but yeah, uh, he, he, I mean, he yeah, he's demonstrated that uh, th that the the the, um, the Supreme Court has cited 
really what, what would be like the, the minority positions to justify mm-hmm. uh, the interpretation of the constitution, even citing like yeah. Jefferson, who wasn't even there when the first amendment was, yeah. was crafted yeah. and ratified. Yeah. Like, Oh, this is the interpretation of right. uh, the, the, the problem, even though he wasn't there. Uh, and, yeah. and again, it's, it's easy to demonstrate that, that both Madison, Jefferson, Thomas Paine had the minority mm-hmm. position mm-hmm. Um, at the time, j- just among the founders. But like what, like what you said, institutionally, mm-hmm. uh, there was, that's indicative of, um, yeah contrary uh view as well so but the, 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 and, like and, when they when they say constitution and freedom religion they're talking about the first amendment and, and as i mm-hmm. like to always point out like well what's the first word of the first amendment uh which is congress <laughs> wait would you do the the, the poll that was like oh, i did the poll I didn't or i've the, never read it <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and so they assume like oh well of course like you can't it, that's anti-establishmentarian mm-hmm. and so therefore that mm-hmm. is the is the governing principle in every state every local yeah. jurisdiction but of course, yeah. that wasn't the case. Uh, it wasn't yeah. the case in yeah. practice. It wasn't the case in theory at the yeah. time. And I think, it, uh, what's his name? Uh, Munez? Um, you know that Munoz, guy? Uh, Munoz from Notre Dame. Yeah. I mean, really he's, he's really basically good. demonstrated what was, I think, fairly obvious, that mm-hmm. the purpose of the of the First Amendment was not, what was more to restrain Congress so that the states could do their do their job. I think, yeah, I'm, exactly. I hope I haven't mis, mis- um, understood no, his argument. Uh, that his, uh, uh, uh it's on it's on the first amendment or it's on, yeah it's on the religious clauses generally so not just the establishment clause and he uses uh, in the book i think he he solely draws from ratification debates so that's like his world right that he's going yeah, to work right. in yeah. to keep it uh, tight and what he just shows from those debates is one on the the religious clauses the two free exercise establishment clause there's comparatively very little debate over then then because so much is agreed upon there's like Mm. there's not much reason to but the one thing that's that is obvious is that no one would have signed on to it if you had disrupted the state establishments and that really cut across both federalist and anti-federalist positions like it was Mm. not a divide Um, but especially the anti-federalist right who uh, they were especially concerned of of a bloated national government generally that might encroach and so it's a deni- it's a it's a maintenance of denominational at the state level distinctions and uh, the status quo essentially. I mean, especially the New England guys, of course. Um, and you see the same recognition if you want, like if people want a good source, I think for a sort of um, you know an, an observation that's contemporary to the time. You find it in stuff like Joseph Story, right, who's writing towards mm-hmm. the end of a lot of these establishments. But he yeah. there's a reason he begins the commentaries on a chapter by chapter history of all the colonies. So he does that first, the first book, just history of all the colonies one by one. And then he goes into describing like the constitution that springs out of those people, right? And then then his chapter on the first amendment, the religious clauses generally, he affirms what what Munoz is saying, you know, and kind of gives three, three versions of establishment that might all have some kind of purchase in the colonies and and the, um, the original states at the time. Um, but that's you know the uh, leading jurist at the time. Better than it's a better source than Thomas Jefferson. Um, yeah. In, in that regard. Uh, so anyway, it's it's all this stuff is easily demonstrated and has been by yeah Munoz is good. I always point people to the book by Max Edling, uh, mm-hmm. which is called Perfecting the Union. It's much shorter. He's actually I think he's actually a Dutch guy, um, but he just he he kind of takes this position that. Um, the real point is what's the difference between the articles of confederation and the federal constitution um so it's the scope is a little bit bigger but his his chapter on like the internal police powers and domestic policing powers of the of the states that are inherited through the charters those couple chapters are excellent on this point of where he's saying you see james wilson ben franklin and, and several other federalists like combing the country after the, the the constitution is trying to be when it's trying to be ratified to assure all, all of them that they're not going to encroach on these state like prerogatives which includes religion and that like it does not touch it don't the first amendment establishment clause does nothing to disrupt what you already have and edley makes the point that if they had not done that and worked really hard there's like several james wilson speeches on it uh you never would have got it off the ground um so huh. anyway you know, these are historians that have no interest. Uh, you know, Mark David Hall has some interest in this this debate ongoing now, but generally, historians Munoz doesn't have any interest in what the uh, the argument we're having in like evangelicalism. Uh, but they've disproven these points, so please do the reading, and then you can come engage <laughs> yeah. with 
with the discussion um, because this is it's it, you're you're we're having to like retread uh, you know we're, the ground that's already been it's been taken care of. like don't reinvent the wheel over and over if the if the yeah. history has been established then just run with it and and make your case so um, yeah very frust- I get I get frustrated with that but. Anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, so read, yeah, th- those books, and um, uh, I think, yeah, Mark David Hall's book, um, which is, and like, he wrote a good uh, book on Sherman too, right? Didn't he, didn't he write a book? He on wrote, Sherman? he wrote R- Roger Sherman's political theory. I think that's probably yeah. more academic, but, um, yeah, that was a good, book but I think, I but yeah, I mean, but, in, but his, his book on like, was America found as Christian nations? It was one of those yeah. question books. I, yeah, right. there's like, there's like 10 different books with that, a similar version right. of that question, yeah. Yeah. whatever John, Mark David John Hall, Fee you'll, did, you'll find it. One. Yeah, his is like similar. Um, yeah. So another thing, so if you guys, whoever listening, if anyone's out there listening, so you got um, <laughs> Joseph's story. You can literally search Joseph's story and then First Rogers. Amendment speech yeah. and press, and boom. Yeah. So I, I have it right here. Yeah. Um, like the first line here that that so he's talking about freedom of speech clause. He yeah. says that this amendment was intended to, to secure to every citizen an absolute right to speak or write or print whatever he might please without any responsibility, public or private, therefore, is a supposition too wild to be indulged uh, by any rational man. This would be to allow to every citizen a right to destroy at his pleasure the reputation, the peace, the property, and even the personal safety of every other citizen. Um, a man might, out of mere malice and revenge, accuse another of the most infamous crimes, might excite against him the indignation of his fellow citizens. He goes on and on and on. He basically yeah. says that like the idea that this is absolute right yeah. And I, I know that there's obviously development, but uh, I, I mean, even like Supreme Court today doesn't say there's an absolute right, but he right, he's right. clearly has this yeah. the the yeah. the idea that speech is an, is not an end in itself, but actually a means yeah. to when there's a good, purpose behind it. It's not simply just you have the you can't say f the draft on a, on a t shirt and call that speech. Right. Like pornography is right. not a, not speech. Yeah. Um, so like yeah. Well, he, go, he goes on to say uh, somewhere it's probably on, on down on the on uh, the religion clauses in particular, and I think it should be the free exercise clause he's talking about. He, and he has this great line I've probably used it before somewhere where it's like paraphrasing the the First Amendment is in you know no regard meant to prostrate Christianity before Islam. Mm-hmm. He says like Muhammadism, you know, or whatever yeah, the yeah, guys back yeah, then, yeah. or lists uh, lists several others. And it's like this is this is not the point. It's not to to equalize or uh, level the playing field um, amongst all religions. It is it was meant to, um, you know, what we've been talking about is establish a certain kind of polity that's that's full of Christians, mainly Protestants, and and then that's when he goes into the three various models and kind of tells you which one the you know the country at the state level was was endorsing essentially at the time of, of varying degrees of establishment. Um, and you and you have in there this sort of pan Protestantism that we've already talked about is is he's clearly recognizing. Um, and you get this another great source that I've I've cited many times that's much later. So if you want to see like continuity, you can go to, um, you know, another Supreme Court Justice David Brewer's um, United States, a Christian nation, which is just a few series of lectures. You can read it in like an hour. Um, and he, he makes the same kind of arguments. Um, and that's in the twenties, you know, that he gave, he gave the lectures at like Swarthmore or something like that, or Haverford maybe. Um, so the same, the same thing that's, you know, from the twenties go, you still have a Sabbath laws being enforced at that time. I think that, I think the last blasphemy case was like, uh, mid, I mean, this would make sense because you have establishments being, uh, eroded slightly in the 1830s. It's going to be in like the late 1830s or late 1840s would be the last blasphemy case, I think. Um, but Is there's it, really, okay, I thought there was you know, one that was, I think that's right at the state level. Later. I think it's Massachusetts, but there okay. could be, there could okay. be, I'm, I may just be forgetting. Definitely. You have Sabbath laws throughout the 1920s, thirties, you know, on up. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those go for quite a while, but there's, there's a great article out there, um, that might be two years old or maybe only a year old it, that was in Harvard wall journal. That's, um, it's something like the original yeah. meaning of, of the First Amendment and blasphemy, you know, law, speech, all this sort of thing. It's a great, it's a great article. People. So actually, let me read. Let me read from that article, if I may. It's a. I can't Just remember the of, author's name, but it's really good. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. So, well, in uh, until well into the 20th century, uh, American law recognized blasphemy as prescribable speech. The black letter rule. The black letter rule was clear: constitutional liberty entailed the right to articulate views on religion. 
but not a right to commit blasphemy, the offense of, uh, quote, malicious reviling God, which encompassed, mm -hmm. quote, profane ridicule of Christ. Mm -hmm. The English common law had punished blasphemy as a crime while excluding, quote, disputes between learned men upon particular controverted points from the scope of criminal uh, blasphemy. Looking at this precedent, 19th century American appellate courts consistently upheld prescriptions on blasphemy, drawing a line between punishable blasphemy and protected religious speech. At the close of the 19th century, the U.S. Supreme Court still assumed that the First Amendment did not permit the publication of blasphemous articles. Hmm. And in 1921, uh, the Maine, Maine, so Maine Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Judicial Court affirmed a blasphemy conviction under the state's oh, First, that's First, First Amendment. True. Even on the eve of American entry into World War II, the Tenth Circuit upheld an anti-blasphemy ordinance against a uh, facial first, I don't know what that means, you probably know that, but First Amendment challenge, I don't know what that means. Uh, only in the post-war period did the doctrine promulgated by appellate courts begin to shift. So th that uh, that article pretty much says that, yeah, it was well accepted, mm -hmm. as you know, or it was accepted generally at least. And then it wasn't until after World War II that things began to shift, which is precisely what yeah. we've all kind of said for. Yeah, I forgot about the main one. That's great because I because the I remember it's a uh, it's Commonwealth versus like Neeland or something is the is the one in Massachusetts that they uphold like a jailing for blasphemy, and after that that's that's the last one in Massachusetts. I forgot that's that's great. The main one is in the twenties. So anyway, and then the Sabbath laws are doing the same thing uh, through the same period. Yeah, so I the so the point is that like most of these people when they when they think of religious liberty freedom yeah. of speech, yeah, they, they might think like they, I think it's it's uh oh you're gonna be I should have got a beer I have to my break. well yeah but, once we got into the Quakers I had forgotten <laughs> I had it sitting here but anyway. yeah I was like man I need I need to smoke um yeah. so uh, I can't smoke in here unfortunately yeah, I guess I could you need to get a system yeah yes yeah, so, um but my boy's room is literally right there so I, I don't know if I can <laughs> so right um. Up. <laughs> where, where was I? Oh, so the point being yeah. is that like these guys, they take their understanding from essentially post-war era, and it's these mm -hmm. conservative myths that we've all heard since we were a kid, mm -hmm. and boomers have heard their entire lives, and it's just myths that every that you know, like Reagan perpetuated all, all these things about that um, religious liberty, freedom mm -hmm. of speech, all that stuff that were just were not true, um, and then people just forgot, like mainly. They don't have the memory of these things. They don't have mm -hmm. memory of prayer in schools. They don't have memory of this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it seems so utterly foreign. And then it's easy to kind of transmit that that narrative into the all of our understanding of history. And so, like, we haven't gotten there yet, but they'll they'll start talking about the American experiment. Uh, um, yeah. when, in, when in reality, yeah. like the experiment you're talking about is the constitutional order of the right. post-war era. Like, like literally yes. when they when they speak of America, they're speaking of a what you might call it a second founding. I know some people want to mm -hmm. say third, but a, a second or maybe people say fourth. I don't know. Second. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the latest founding, the most latest founding, which would be kind of from the sixties onward. Yeah. That's the America they're talking about. Whereas like you and mm -hmm. I, when we talk about American Christian nationalism or kind of American mm -hmm. political order uh, to use that terminology, mm -hmm. we mean something prior to that era. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so yeah. And, and w which is the majority history of America. So it's, it's always weird right. for me to be called un-American when like my ideas are literally just more, more common in mm -hmm. American history than their ideas, which is a very, actually very recent. Yeah. So, yes. Should we move on? Yeah. It, let's, let's, uh, let's keep this rolling <laughs> since we're just beating up. It's so important <laughs> that we do look back at history because yeah. while we as Christians, of course, are rejecting what the secularists would espouse that Jefferson meant by the separation of church and state, that Christians can't even engage government, that civil government has a no objective moral truth at its foundation oh, that ultimately is the measurable difference between what we criminalize and prohibit versus what we uh, what is permissible in society. Uh, what is that difference between mala in se versus mala prohibitum, this concept in law that certain things are just inherently evil and then some things just for the the good and well-ordered uh, establishment of society, then we have to have those uh, prohibited just to have a moral and upright society. Um, so we tend to, as Christians, um, uniformly understand that it's a leftist proposition, the separation of church and state. But what's fascinating about the Christian nationalist position is that when they talk about separation of church and state, they're actually 
uh, coming at it from the right. And they're suggesting that integralism means that we don't have a separation of church and state. Jefferson was wrong because he was a deist. And we have to have this integral uh, type of cohesive philosophy. I mean, she's just like making stuff up. I don't, I'm not understood even sure. in I don't understand. In context in their moment in history. Just and words. they expressly. Well, it's just like making so. I, I don't know. I, I maybe someone has said that. Oh, he was a deist. I mean, maybe someone has said that. I, I've never. Said I would. That. I always say he was a bad deist because he believed in like the intervention yeah. of providence and things, which means you're not. But, but yeah, that's again, not like, why he would be. Well, first of all, she's not representing. I don't know. She's oscillating between being descriptive and prescriptive, so it's a little confusing. But the she's not representing Jefferson or the, or the people she's saying represent correctly. But even then, I wouldn't say Jefferson's wrong because he's a deist, um, just like I wouldn't say I want blasphemy laws so I can shut down people that disagree with me, which he, he said or Roach said earlier. So it's like these kind of motives uh, it's, or, or I guess biases, maybe it's projection. It's not because he's a deist. There, there are other I mean, I, I get annoyed at that category applied to that period, but that's a different different yeah. thing. But the I think it's I think it's kind of sloppy and it's it's a bit of a, of a psyop and a myth. But anyway. You know, someone who's who's imperfectly orthodox, we can say for sure. Like you wouldn't want him to teach in your Sunday school class, probably. And uh, you know, I, th there's not a reason to disqualify. You have a lot of people at the time that that would fit that mold. Uh, not as many as it would fit an orthodox Christian mold, but some of them. Uh, it's not. No one's saying that, and no one's also no one is saying that. Uh, well, I guess she was describing the left it would say Christians can't even be involved in society. I don't know who's saying that. I, I don't know. I anyway. we can keep going. Maybe we cut, it, our, okay. cut her off halfway through her reasoning. Anyway, but, yeah, I, mean, I would just say too, like, yeah, I mean, so John Adams is an interesting case because he was anti-Trinitarian, right. but he yeah. supported, you know, these, these church, these state establishments. So right. I, I don't know yeah. what like their, their heresy or heterodox views have to do, but anyway, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we're just being too picky on, on her. <laughs> thing here that's not fair. They rejected so that we had two different spheres of authority under God, which is the civil government and the church government, and it wasn't integral. I mean, we've exactly. talked about this already. <clears throat> exactly. That's so much of what we see here is is that there's this strong return to the idea of the compulsion of religion within this Christian nationalist movement. And what they're doing with it is that you'll find a lot of them, and again, it's a broad movement and there's a lot of zeal with it, is when you look at these sort of thought terminating cliches that they're giving, either, you know, Christ thought or chaos. And if you don't cliches. sort of have the, the fully orbed, all of the aspects of God's divine revelation written into American law, then you can't have any ethical no aspects given to society. And I go, first of all, just looking at the argument, that's a false bifurcation. It's not either this or that. And people might be thinking, well, what's in the middle of this or what's another alternative? And I go, the natural law tradition that we have throughout Western society. The natural you know, law I tradition. Can still oh. <laughs> legislate morality <laughs> <Who is> this? <laughs> because if it's true that all of us are made in the image of God and we have these self-evident principles of morality that are given to all people at all times and all places, I can legislate the moral law because it's something that exists outside of all of us because it's something that God has given as a feature to all of humanity. And it's something that resides inside all of us because he gave us not only a law, but a conscience. And that's so much of what the American founders realized that we have these self evident truths. Okay. So, you know, what law, uh, I think they go on to talk about uh, law of nature, nature is God. I always find, sure. I don't know if we mentioned this already, but I always find this so weird. It's like, they think the natural law is nothing but a set of like ethical commands in relation to man. And it yeah. never dawns on them that like, no, like natural law, the, the, the chief part of it, like the principal part, yeah. I mean, the, the part from which all the rest flow yeah. is, you know, worship the true God. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. like, literally we are, we were born for a, we were created to do a lot of things, but the principal thing and the highest thing we can do as mm -hmm. rational beings, as beings under a moral law, is to acknowledge and worship God. Mm -hmm. So it's always so it's always it's just it's always weird to hear people talk about the law of nature as, as if somehow that's like an atheistic, it's as if we can cut off like the lawgiver yeah. from that law, and it's just a matter of how I relate to fellow man. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's like you want to legislate the moral law. It's like, okay, then ban atheism, ban polytheism, um, ban like profanation of Sabbath, uh, ban dishonoring of of God, (laughs) ban, you know, ban or profane rights. I mean, yeah. That's the moral law, and that's the first right. chief part of the moral law. So, anyway, it's <laughs> no, that's I, no, that's try. a good, that's exactly right. Um, I mean, I think just, just, I mean, that, yeah, that was a good, that's a, that's a good point to make. The, um, I think the thing that he's mainly driving at, and you've just, I mean, I'm so tired of this, and it's just been thrown around over and over, is is the theonomic, you know, accusation. No one's saying that that I've noticed in in our circles. I mean, there's theonomists uh, that, that we'd be friendly with. I'm friendly with theonomists and they're, they're fine people. Um, but I don't, I've made clear, I don't share their position. You've made that clear in, in terms of the application of the law at, at least. And, um, you know, as if you have, I mean, I think he literally just said the whole Bible though, which would be odd that you'd need to legislate the whole Bible into existence. Um, but certainly not the, you know, the old Testament civil law, but at the same time with this, this sort of relationship, this, thing he's wanting to say, this bifurcation between modes of revelation he's wanting to set up between scripture and then, you know, the atheistic moral laws you're talking about that and you've already addressed the issue with God there. The other thing is if you, again, do the reading, especially 17th century, and this is even the case in the 18th century, um, it's certainly the case in 17th century, like common law cases, um, is I think the, uh, the bifurcation of the two modes of revelation are not nearly as stark as we even, even Christians, even people that be on our side in this debate would make them today. I think it's much more fluid and kind of acceptable to, you know, when, so when you cite scripture in a, in a case at the, at the common law bench, you're not a theonomist. And it's also true that when you're citing just something from reason or the tradition, you're not denying that scripture could be cited for the same thing. Like, the, of course, all this should cohere, especially if the natural law in miniature is republished in the Decalogue, like everything just kind of, you you build on it and stack upon it. And you can, um, you know, you'll sort, sort of see this in the methodology of 17th century sources of like, they'll, they'll begin with a, you know, one of the pagans, and then they'll go to maybe, you know, a medieval source, and then you'll go to, you know, maybe a newer uh, scholastic source, and then you'll pull in scripture as well, or some kind of order like that. And so you build your case right. with your source material, and ultimately they're all they're all agreeable. That's the whole point. So I don't know. I just get tired with that that kind of argument being made. But the the simplest uh, retort of that is is you know what you already said to to them, which I think is is key. That um you know the, the great. Let's do the moral law, but uh, you're not going to like the results. Yeah, it's isn't odd to, I mean, it's one thing. So I, I think it might require like more argumentation on our part to say that, okay. Uh, to like enforce distinctively Christian things, mm-hmm. but the fact that like atheism is unnatural is not a, a distinctively Christian truth. It's not a truth of grace. It's not like yeah. prior to the gospel or prior to grace, atheism is acceptable. No, like atheism is in a sense like the, like a, one of the like a, a chief sin because it denies yes. the the source from which the rest of the law flows. So you can somehow affirm the second table, but be an atheist. The, the most unnatural thing you can be, is my point, is is to be an atheist. Mm-hmm. So why then, if if that's the ground of your uh, mm-hmm. your your civil law, why not then mm-hmm. a, apply that and suppress atheism? Um, right. So right. and then again, this was why would someone like John Locke say? Uh, they, they should they should censor or suppress atheism. Well, because mm-hmm. atheists have terrible. Like, if you're an atheist, how can you trust them? How can you trust their oaths? How can you trust yeah. their morals? How could they be so degenerate to d- deny the being of a god? Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the well, being you, of and, God. Um, no, that's right. And you see this in the um, you know we still call the religious test for offices for office, even in the states where they don't have uh, the Trinity or uh, some of the some of the states required the affirmation of the of divine inspiration of Scripture. So those two things are not not the case in every state, but all of them have something like you need to affirm, um, you know, a, a um, eternity, essentially, that there's a judgment after death. You need to affirm that uh, God exists. These but for this reason that you can't be trusted with public office if you don't believe in these natural truths that would to deny them would constitute atheism. Right. So that, that's what they're getting at. Um that just used to be, that was just a supposition of in the 18th century. And that's why you have no 
um, none of the founders affirming atheism, at least, you know, publicly, and I don't think privately either, uh, yeah. pain would be the closest you could get to. And that's why, like, once he really went off the rails, uh, it, he was not received well anymore. Like when he went to France and yeah. you know, kind of outed himself of where he, he, what he really thought about. So I think Jefferson got in trouble for like writing a endorsement essentially of his age of reason. But anyway, like none of them are atheists. And th that's one of the, I mentioned David Brewer earlier. He's like, um, his case is basically anytime religion is mentioned in the early documents, it's positive and mentioned positively, it's Christian. And there's no mention of uh, positively of atheism or of any other type of religion. So right. even like when they choose not to talk about religion in certain cases, it uh, doesn't negate, you know, the, the assumption should be that, the, that they're Christians and that this is the po the positive version of religion is Christianity. Anything else is is rejected and they don't feel the need to say so all the time. So, um, you know, that's, I guess, another historical point for this, since we're still talking constitution and founding or whatever they're saying. I don't know <laughs> where, they, where we left them. Yeah, let's keep it whatever. going. Given by our creator through a natural law of which we can legislate morality without legislating blasphemy laws for differing over the Sabbath yeah, or whether one's a Quaker <laughs> yeah. or a Baptist or a Puritan or so on and so forth. Yeah, and I think that's an incredibly important point that, that when our founders talked about the laws of nature and of nature's God, they were not promoting a theocracy or even really a theonomy in the, the general sense that that term is understood, what they were suggesting. And this is why I, I don't think that the faith of the founders has any uh, particular specific um, governance over the uh, the U.S. Constitution and our broader civil law. And I make that argument, actually, in my book, The Legal Basis for a Moral Constitution, that some of these oh, very well-meaning authors, like, for example, David Barton, who goes out and he tries to make this claim that all of the founders were necessarily and they had to have been very sincere Christians. I'm saying, well, what does it matter? It doesn't, because even if they were deists, let's just say that Jefferson, we know for a fact, and that's that's an inarguable position. He's a deist. Well, the Constitution still refers to the laws of nature and of nature's God that is established. They're self-evident. They're observable. C.S. Lewis would have described it as discoverable truths. We can't escape the reality to which we're presented. We know that government has inherent limits. There are things that we simply can't legislate. And there are also things that we can observe from nature, from from human beings have a conscience and because we have life we cannot arbitrarily foreclose that without due process thus we outlaw murder i mean very basic things that that are so very different as well from the libertarian view of simply um the non-aggression principle because then you get into a whole separate set of all problems right, right. with defining articulable harms and all of that and so if we take the natural law position and say, look at what the left is doing, and they're wanting to arbitrarily suggest that we can codify everything that is unnatural. Homosexual marriage, that is not natural. Children can't come from a marriage uh, like that. That the whole gender phenomenon and that this is, um, this is a spectrum. That's unnatural. We can naturally observe male versus female. Um, all of these things, even abortion, it's a medical intervention that is unnatural to deal with. Okay. I just, you know, I don't all know. Right. All right. There's a lot. I, I, mean, I, I, I know what, like she's setting up there. I mean, we've been long winded ourselves, so let's give her <laughs> some slack, but I mean, uh, I mean, she's setting it up so that like the left does this and now Christian nationalists want to do this as well. It's unnatural. I'll just reply like, you know, the first three commands, at least in the 10 commandments are unnatural. I understand there's a dispute mm -hmm. about the fourth and how it's natural, but the first mm -hmm. three are unnatural. They should be de demonstrable by, you know, through reason and, and nature. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, do you, have, do you have anything to say to what keep going? No, yeah. I mean, I know, I don't think she's doing this because she wants, she wants to say there's, um, so she's affirming there is a morality transcendent morality. That's, that's natural that you don't need, I guess, I guess we're saying, special revelation for i think she's affirming that and that but she keeps um all the examples she's given so far are sort of these uh empirically observable not ones through uh through process of you know reason and, and sort of the um you're accused of being a Thomist all the time so i can say the Thomistic, you know sense of a participation in 
uh, you know, the law um, of God or, or in, in the eternal law, you know, which constitutes the natural law. So it's it's more of this, uh, you know, man and a woman, it's observable, it's a biological fact. That's the law of nature. Um, and of course, it's no less than that. That's that's fine. But it's this very um, scientific kind of thing rather than saying, well, yeah. we can we can reason from certain premises to the fact that um, a God exists. And if God, you know, there has to be the supreme being uh, the unmoved mover and therefore he deserves to be worshipped because he's the highest being. And, you know, these kinds of things, they're not they're not really coming into play for her at this time, even as she's name checking that nature and nature's God and not asking, well, which which God would that be? What would the assumption be? I don't, you know, I don't know. It's just very it's kind of all over the place. Um, and I know that, of course, for this would be true for us, too, like some of our main concerns have to do with the litany of things, the three things she listed um, that are that are societal ills like we and we would agree that natural law precludes those. Uh, but we I guess the fundamental difference is we just say the natural law also precludes the things that they're more public sense that they're more comfortable with now uh, because mm -hmm. they've been conditioned by the, the post-war uh, assumptions, you know, read into law. So I guess that would be to try to find a source of, of like the technical agree a disagreement. I guess that would be one. Um, and it could be solved by doing the reading, but uh, we'll, <laughs> with a pregnancy. Um, and so it, it obviously miscarriage is a natural, unfortunate and tragic event, but it's still a part of nature. So all of these things that the left is suggesting are inherent rights are actually unnatural. And our founders would have understood and the the American experience would have understood that we don't have to specifically ordain a state sponsored religion that is compulsory, that includes blasphemy laws, that includes um, determining people as heretics, but that we can say you're free to believe in any God you want, practice religion, not totally however you want, obviously, because there are still murder laws and things like that. Um, but you are free to exercise religion. You are free to be a part of any religion or no religion at all. But the civil government still has an objective standard on the laws of nature and of nature of God. And that seems very self-evident. Yet the Christian nationalist position mirrors in this way leftism because the woke wants to institute blasphemy laws. If you don't say, and we don't, the government isn't compelling you to bake the cake, to create the website, to speak gender preferred pronouns, to now in California have uh, the. So, so now we know, so now, now we know the kind of the tactic here. You get, get the scary yeah. left and the woke, and then you get these yeah. Christian nationalists who want to essentially be the same thing. So that's, that's kind of the rhetoric, you know, you, you, you if you're that, that silly line, if, if you're afraid of the left, wait till you see the post-Christian right or whatever. Or whatever. You know, it's kind of that same kind of thing. Um, yeah, I and, and as you've I've already kind of explained that that the sort of laws that we would be okay with in principle and, and mm -hmm. maybe also in prudence uh, are just the ubiquitous within our own tradition. So if you want to talk yeah. about the American experience, uh, mm -hmm. unless you want to say that what the, the the only experience that counts is from 1950 something on or or the, whatever the incorporation yeah. doctrine. Was it 1945? Whatever it was. So 40, from then, on, yeah. So from from then on, like that's the American experience. Well, we're just trying to say, well, wait, you know, let's take the entire experience up, yeah. and uh, and take yeah. that seriously. Uh, and it, I think that there's other other things like the idea of we need a state religion. So mm -hmm. that's one of the one of the, been the con confusions, especially about my view, is that I I think it's okay to have a state religion. I think I think it's okay to have a national church and all that. Um, I don't think that's appropriate for every case. I don't think there should, I absolutely do not think there should be given our, our federal arrangements, a, a mm -hmm. national church that's right. uh, operates out of Washington. I'm okay. Yeah. If a state wants to say, we're going to establish some kind of church um, mm -hmm. and it's going to be publicly funded. I don't see that on the horizon, but I would be okay with that in principle. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but yeah, I, I, but I do think, I do think that in order for the law the second table duties of the law to flourish properly, to be properly mm -hmm. ordered, there needs to be an acknowledgement among the people people of the lawgiver. This goes mm -hmm. back to the basic founding founders principle that religion is like the idea of religion is necessary for a free, happy, flourishing, mm -hmm. civic, a virtuous people. Essentially ubiquitous within that. Even Madison believed that, as I understand it, uh, he just didn't think that state establishments would be conducive to that he thought it would corrupt religion and make it worse and all mm -hmm. that 
Um, so yeah, I, I think that you, that we, and at the same time, we can have a type of religious liberty such that like, you know, for, for most of our history, Jews were able to re, uh, worship freely and have synagogues at the same time. There was in, in a holistic sense, apart from like each part, the, as a whole, we understood ourselves as a, mm -hmm. Americans, as a Protestant and a pride as a Protestant country. And there was an interest mm -hmm. in, in maintaining that. Mm -hmm. So, and as a, you know, as a Christian Protestant country, mm -hmm. and, and you can affirm that as a, like, that's what we are as a whole, while also permitting parts of it to be kind of divergent from that. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to think what you ascribe to the whole has to be described, ascribed to every part. It's just a basic right. principle of logic. Right. So you yeah. can say we are this as a whole, but also have different parts. So uh, but yeah. that's what I would say, yeah. you know, with Muslims and Jews and and kind of, you know, like heretical sort of um, yeah. religions as well as you could freely worship. But we're this we're like as a whole. Right. But, Right. And you and something we haven't mentioned yet and we don't have to get into because we've it's it's kind of commonplace on the whatever we are, the new Christian right or something. The, um, you know, to recognize certain um, undeniable social phenomenon that are present in some regard in every every society, whether they're, they're so the only question is whether they'll be officially recognized or not. And one of those is, you know, it's common to say now is establishment. You know, there's no neutrality, this sort of thing of something is going to serve this function and you're going to have something informing the laws and you're going to have some kind of status hierarchy based on participation in a, in a public religion of some kind in some way. And you could, we, you know, we could talk about that forever of how it manifests now, but it does. And so the only question is, you know, which one it's going to be. And then whether you're going to basically say, say the quiet part out loud and kind of recognize it and then, act accordingly in a way that I think I think is more fair because it provides more explicit notice for people. It's it's more obvious about the the prospect and requirements of like assimilation and and participation in the full civil society. So I think it's better to just say, here's you know, here's the kind of establishment we have. Either it's this is back to Joseph's story. It's like it could be general Christianity. It could be generally Protestant, or it could be congregationalist, like that's your three tiers. So Christianity, mm -hmm. which includes all denominations, and then that you still allow, just like we, we, you know, combating the Puritan myths, uh, they, they have room for dissenters, like having room for dissenters is just a fact of life also, unless you want to be yeah. an unjust society that is, uh, and actually waste a lot of energy too. like, even if it was a just crusade, like to, to do that, um, the cr crusades were defensive wars anyway, but uh, anyway, the, uh, but you know, you get, you have to have room for dissenters and I think it's, it's fair to have, you know, but you can at the same time um, be self-conscious about what you are, what you want to preserve a certain way of life, which necessarily includes a religious aspect. In fact, it may be the central aspect. It's the glue to society. And so having some variation of establishment is not only unjust, but inevitable and preferable to for it to be the true religion, to be a Christian one. And then we can get you can get into the weeds. I mean, this is all theory land anyway, but um, you can get into the weeds about how it's going to function, or, you know, how you're going to distribute labor between the two powers in a certain way. But there's just something is going to be in that role. And, and all we're saying is, well, the state's duty is to to uh, because the state's going to do things to prop these things up. It's going to reward certain behavior and all this. Um, so it's its duty to recognize true morality and true religion. And that's Christianity. So and especially when you have a, a place that is um, historically Christian, still predominantly Christian, in fact, still predominantly and historically Protestant, that's what it should be. Um, that doesn't affirm any sort of, uh, you know, uh, neocon kind of aspiration to in a millenarian fashion you know do this to the whole world i mean the the cotton or davenport whichever it is piece we talked about earlier he gets to the end if you remember in the discourse and it's like you know if you went over to turkey right now meaning in 1666 mm. uh, or whenever it's published um you know you wouldn't you wouldn't expect to be treated the same you're not turkish and you're not muslim and you know this is the height of like uh, the Ottoman Empire still a thing, so you're not you're not of them. You would be hopefully they wouldn't kill you, and that would be your best like option. And you could right. you could just live there peacefully. And he's like, why um, if we have the option, like as they did at the time, you know, the, in a new plantation, and what's its religion supposed to be? Why wouldn't you make it Christianity? This is just what a people does for themselves, and like it's inevitable. 
Your expectation should be conditioned by that as to how you'll be treated. Hopefully you're treated uh, kindly, but you, um, you know, you're an outlier. So you act like a dissenter and, and that's fine. So anyway, it's, it's just like, it's a very realist perspective they have as well. And the, the effect of liberalism in the post-war period is to pretend that these realities don't exist anymore. And so then you can't actually talk about them in a reasonable, non-hysterical way. Yeah. It's like, it's like we've been, when, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, just, um, it, it's like we've been cut off from this, this sort of asking the sort of questions and that have been asked for hundreds of years and, and, and yeah. we've been cut off from those questions very recently. You know, I, I think what you pointed out with like, yeah, with that document, it's what's discourse on civil government by either Cotton yeah. or Davenport, whoever. You yeah, know, it's probably about. Davenport. I think I think Francis Bremer like said it's Davenport, so he should probably win. He's like the Daven okay. Davenport expert. Yeah, like th that that document alone, even from like the very like what you cited, I think it's in the beginning, actually. And, and it's concerning oh, okay. the statement of the question because he's responding yeah. to a uh, like a uh, an individual or friend or something like that. Yeah. And and he's saying, well, no, the the. the he's clarifying what the question is between them, which mm -hmm. is not you show up someplace, you enact a, a certain order mm -hmm. at that ideal order. He was saying, no, like you have to, what the statement the question is that are the conditions appropriate? What, what, what are, mm -hmm. what is, what is um, possible given the conditions? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you yes. show up to Turkey, you're, you're not going to have like a, a Christian polity. If you, if you, mm -hmm. if you all are united in religion, you show up to Massachusetts Bay and you say, we're going to establish this order. Well, you can mm -hmm. do that. And his argument was, well, why not do that? I think right. to his credit, Neil Shinvey has basically said that if you were colonizing yeah. Mars with a group of people and they all had the same religious yeah. beliefs, then in principle, yeah. or no, even yeah. according to prudence, yeah. you could establish certain laws to maintain that. So to his credit, he right. has affirmed that. But he, he doesn't he affirms, think he do that now. Right. And, and uh, you know, if someone was just arguing that, that's that's fine. But the, the question then, the follow-up, you know, and I, I'm, I'm friends with Neil, so it's not, he knows where I'm, I stand on this stuff. Um, is it's okay to do that if like you had a hundred percent buy-in, like that's the, that's what he's thinking. Yeah, of. yeah, right, right. And then are you, the next question is like, are you allowed to do things to maintain the majority buy-in? That's like yeah, where the rubber yeah, meets to the be road. exclusive. Yeah. Which, yeah. which literally is the, the scenario of the, of New England that we set up. It's like, everyone agrees. I mean, they already had non-Christians with them, you know, uh, even even in Plymouth, like Bradford writes about some of the, you know, punks that like are on the ship with them and stuff. But the point is, like, are you allowed to then maintain it? That's the real point. And yeah. then, like, also, what's the threshold? Because if it's anything uh, beneath 65 percent, we still have the threshold. So we still have the quorum. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. The population. Yeah. So I don't know. So I, mean, I think that the point the point being is that yeah, we yeah. restore the conversation, see what's prudent, be yeah. realist on the ground. For that's sure. our tradition. Sure. That's yeah. like you know uh, one of the early chapters of my dissertation. Like I talk about that, and then say, mm -hmm. well, the founding is a new sort of circumstances and all that. So mm -hmm. anyway, I, I yeah, let, let's let's keep going. Okay. The um, contemplation of um, of child custody around parents having to affirm their child's gender or something than what they biologically are. Sure what, Those are basically modern day blasphemy laws. And know. so the Christian nationalists, Lindsay and you know, O'Fallon, have talked about, and it's a really it's a popular sort of postmodern fallacy known as the Mott and Bailey. And the Mott is yeah, usually the nicer term. term. The Bailey is sort of the crazy term, but they're using language off of one another where it sort of sounds the same but it's ultimately different. So what's funny is, is that as it relates to this, and you see the Christian nationalists talking, they'll say things like, you know, we really want to have Christian morality in society. And then the flip side of it is, is they'll say things like, we want a Protestant Franco, or we think that the constitution already really doesn't exist because look at all the ways that we've undermined it over the last hundred years. And, you know, all of these different things. And I go, well, guys, first of all, we see your manipulations and what you're trying to do with it. Some of them on social media are just the gift that keeps on giving. So when you see some people talking about how they want to have these new foundings of the Constitution, you ask, well, what does it mean to have a new founding of the Constitution? Well, it means you have to have an undoing of the old Constitution, an unfounding of the previous sort of set of laws and fabric that bound one another together. So what does that ultimately mean? Well, when you look at what they're doing with their project, not the, the nice things that they're saying about the project, but the, the Bailey aspects of it, they want to fundamentally do away with key aspects of the Constitution. 
And when you follow some of them, freedom of speech will be done away with because if they're going to enact blasphemy laws off of the things that you say, that's fine. I mean, we, we've dealt with all this before. So, I guess but we've dealt I, with all of it, yeah. Yeah, but I think the the one thing is this like Mott and Bailey thing. I, it, again, it's like he's 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 taking the, the different comments you see on social media mm -hmm. and and thinking that they're somehow coordinated is he is right that there are people who will say, Oh, well, Christian nationalism is just, you want to enact a, uh, like a, a, a Christian morality by which they mean, mm -hmm. you know, in gay marriage or no more right. trans or whatever, no abortion, mm -hmm. uh, which is not, I don't mention any of those in the book on purpose because I knew people right. would do that. I knew they would, yeah. they would go back and say, well, it's actually just about this and that. And I, so I, I don't yeah. know, yes. I think it's all about that, but, um, but yeah, I think he's just he's he's taking these different like contradictory definitions and and statements, and then turning that into sort of conspiracy that we're all just kind of conspiring to make this Mott and Bailey when it's really just right, yeah, just Twitter. People. I mean, Twitter's a chaos; it's a wild west. I don't know what you want. Yeah. So uh, yeah, fundamentally, no, I, yeah, I no, I agree. The only thing I was going to add is the. Um, well, you know, it's, I won't get us under the rabbit trail, but some of the things he's mentioning offhand that are comments, again, like you said, it's it's Twitter, um, whether it's about regime cycle stuff, you know, which is which is also uh, you can easily find in such analysis in the founders um, or talking about what's been done post uh, World War Two, post Civil Rights Act, these sorts of things with uh, the constitutional order and, and constitutional precedent that I, do, I don't understand why you're not allowed to make those observations and and talk about them uh, which is all i really see people doing they're not like celebrating bad things that have happened or bad things that, that could come to fruition but it's sort of a descriptive rather than prescriptive uh, assessment of of the state current state of affairs and then on top of that you know roach is like referring they they will say you know it's the two constitutions argument this is like Caldwell yeah, and some yeah. of the other Claremont guys, yeah, everyone's familiar. Um, and they're saying that, and and so therefore they need, if they want a new, you know, establishment of the constitutional order, that means you have to destroy the old one. But all that's really being said is that we want to get back behind um, inappropriate developments and incursions from the 20th century. So I don't, yep. I don't really understand his argument in that way because no one's saying we want to, we want to bulldoze everything. We're saying there's been improper additions that would be good to get rid of. Um, at the same time, if the, some of these things aren't addressed in, in more fundamental things like social unrest and all this demographics issues, whatever, uh, foreign wars, if you don't address these things, you're going to have the continued breakdown of your society, which in classical analysis from, you know, you can find in atoms and stuff means you're going to have a new regime type come in and it's an unfavorable and disruptive process, but it's, it's just what happens. I don't understand why all that's so scary and objectionable, right? It's scary, but I don't understand why it means it's he's, he's making it sound like there's a bunch of people on Twitter, like you said, that are coordinated that are plotting a coup, right? Like that's how, how he's making yeah. it sound. And that's, I, I think that's a, a bad faith uh, way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and maybe, and maybe he's some guy did say the constitution sucks or he went, yeah, death with sure. it, down with the con. I mean, maybe he did see that. I, I've, I've never said that. And yeah, um, you've never said that. And, but yeah, I mean, when we say that, well, I mean, if he says that, like, if, if we get our way and we get blasphemy laws and that's the end of the constitution or the death of the constitution, then the constitution died on arrival. It was dead on arrival <laughs> because they had them at the time of the founding right, and for hundreds right. of years afterwards. So it's yeah. just like, and so no get, apparent contradiction. But, but, yeah. But he is like to, to put it in the frame of like the multiple constitutions, he mm -hmm. is defending the latest constitution. Like he's defending right. yeah. that. And we are yeah. defending the original. Mm -hmm. um, so yes. yeah, I, I guess no, well, let's keep going. Doing away with freedom of speech or freedom of religion when they want to say things such as anybody who is a quote false teacher, heretic, blasphemer, likes his or quote. idolater, and they'll go That's on you. and add <laughs> and all the rest that the Christian prince needs to fundamentally persecute them, and they'll say that either means imprisonment, banishment, and or death. That's a doing away of the freedom of religion. So. 
what we had to fundamentally. So I guess I should respond to that. Is it get this all tiresome? Maybe maybe yeah. we're are, are you tired of doing this? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've, you've, I mean, he's just they're just starting to repeat themselves. But I mean, I've you yeah, can, it's you can 18 minutes. That uh, so that he is quoting me trying to narrow down the statement of the question or the question or the thing at issue between modern religious liberty advocates and mm -hmm. earlier understandings of the liberty of conscience. And so I say for like two pages, it is not this, it's not that, it's not mm -hmm. this, it's not that. Here's what it is. So I say it and I say the civil leader or civil magistrate may do these things. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's the question, M meaning like that is the pointed issue. If we're going to argue about this, you have to deny, you deny that, I affirm that. That's not a call for every single civil leader to go round up the Mormons or mm -hmm. to go find the Roman Catholics. Um, mm -hmm and and round them up and throw them in prison or put them on a ship and ship them off to iceland or something mm -hmm. like that's not like what it's it and and then from there you can establish a principle and then you could say well how do you apply that in context um i talk about means and ends so if the end is a flourishing of uh, of religious and, and civil life then well what's the means to that well in some circumstances in, in new england for example it'd be like quakers why do you keep coming back get the out of here you know, other circumstances like our own is where we can't start rounding up everyone who just is not Presbyterian or it's not this or that. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we won't do that. Um, and because that would be that would have the opposite effect. The means would then actually d would fail to achieve the end and do the opposite. It would cause mm -hmm. civil disruption, strife and possibly the fall of the, the border itself. So, right. But, but he doesn't he doesn't think through these things even though I've laid it out and yeah. it makes me wonder if he's being dishonest uh, or he's trying to do what's been going on to me for about a year which is hey let's take a screenshot of this scary thing and say wolf believes you should you know kill heretics um, right now um so anyway yeah I, I mean, mean like, yeah it's I mean it goes back to the thing they don't want to hear which is you know you have to I say this all the time that you know you have to establish in principle, before you can make concessions to context, you know, by prudence, uh, what evangelicals are fond of doing is starting with the concessions they've made to uh, the current order and and turning those into absolute principles. Um, you know, things have yeah. happened as, as historical contingencies, and they want to make them. Well, this is the way it's it's done. Um, so they're unfamiliar with reasoning this way, and they start uh, exactly backwards. And you know, just, I, I guess I would just say to him, just deal with it. It's in the tradition. You go, you, you don't have to, in everything you just said, I mean, in principle, it is completely just for the civil magistrate to enforce um, or, or rather punish, you know, these, these sorts of things, uh, heretics, blasphemers, uh, idolaters, etc. cetera. Um, and, but almost every good text that, that I've, you know, read in uh, the, the two centuries, basically, that we're, we're fond of, um, at least take notice of the prudential aspects. And this even goes, but, you know, very famous passage in Aquinas and where he's talking about um, whether you should uh, abolish brothels in Paris, you know, in his day. And he basically, conclu basically concludes that any change in the law is violence. It's like a, it's a violent act to change the law. It's what people are used to, especially customs. And so, you can do that. You can justifiably do that because the, the brothels are sinful, but it's so ingrained like in the society that he says, this is an example, you know, I don't want brothels, but it's an example where it's probably more prudent to not disrupt it because it would be so disruptive that you might not recover from, from it and the polity might be damaged. And this is ultimately what the statesman has to consider, hmm. you know, so, so like at the same time, he's writing in Deregno, you know, to the, the, the King of Cyprus or whatever, um the principal basis for like everything you know here's how society begins here's where rule comes from here's the types of governments like you begin this way then you get down to prudential aspects and you and you do the sort of advice for kings and say you know ultimately you got to preserve your rule ultimately you got to be stable ultimately like you need to do justice to god but you may have so on and so forth you get it um so it's just very frustrating yeah. that this sort of approach is not uh, so foreign. It's a little scary. The most scary thing is that it is foreign, I guess, because I don't know how you're supposed to uh, talk about this. Stuff. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the Aquinas one is that's an interesting case because you can disagree with the reasoning, but still understand mm -hmm. the, 
process he how right. we how we how we went from a principle and and thought of the end in mind like you know again yeah. all all civil policy has to conduce to the good of society and so that's why i deny that you'd have to that you have this like set of laws that are you have to apply in every place mm -hmm. regardless of consequences so it would make no yeah. sense to say we're going to have a presbyterian state right now and like we use the mm -hmm. heavy hand of government to have make it happen well, what's mm -hmm. going to happen is everyone's going to say no we're not and mm -hmm. there's going to be strife civil war and it actually yeah. fails to um to to uh achieve the end sought the opposite yeah of it. so and which yeah. that means you and shouldn't do it like if you're going to destroy right. the commonwealth through a law you think is righteous then that right. law is actually a bad law <laughs> so don't yes do that. yeah it's not in the situation it's not good I mean, that doesn't, this is, you know, this is part of where, where Aquinas then gets into talking about, you know, law is supposed to lead men to virtue, but it has to do it gradually in most, most cases. You have to slowly try to, and the, you know, the good ruler can see the end vision and mm -hmm. figures out the incremental steps, you know, this kind of thing. So that's a, a good, prudent ruler that's handed like a state of affairs. He's not at the beginning of a commonwealth's founding. He's just given this like thing. How do you govern? Um, but if you get to, you know, you have sort of blank slate, whatever, you have a bigger range of options. Um, but it doesn't preclude, you know, certain scenarios, it's a judgment call where you, you do kind of just take the heat if you're like, it's possible, it's the, the society isn't going to collapse, there's going to be blowback, but it's it's a just cause. So we would say that with like abortion, right? Banning abortion is, a, is an example of where it's justice, um, it's good, the outlet is there to do it, you know, it's, it's not overnight going to uh, turn this, the, the country's not going to lapse into civil war, you know, most likely over it. So you can, you make the call and you're like, this is going to be disruptive, but it's good violence, like to do this because it's just, so you can do that with a range of things, but this is just what you were getting into with some of those initial, you know, setting up the, the state of the question, but then get into later is, is really comes to down to these, you can't give people a concrete list um, of what, what to do in a prudential situation according to prudence in a given situation because it's necessarily uh, dependent on the circumstances someone has to be there to make that call and they have to know what the uh, the range of options in principle are to them based on their authority from god before they can then assess what am i able to do here for the good of the people and i just think that that's uh it's, it's a very i mean it's, we know it's important because it's what good uh political philosophy texts used to address it's where they would begin and now they they don't anymore it's all like sentimental pietism and biblicism or something so anyway uh, but, you know that was a screed but it's very frustrating no uh, yeah we can we can leave it at that, on that point. <laughs> yeah and for people who are on our side when we talk about prudence we're not we want to be clear that that it's it's not an excuse for action so just because, mm -hmm. oh, it might disrupt things like you mentioned abortion time and like, we, mm -hmm. yeah, like some women are going to wear their vagina hats and in, in, like in, in halls and do and But so what? I mean, OK, they're there, then they yeah. go home, like unless they're going right. to somehow it's going to cause like a civil war and overthrow. I mean, then maybe not. Yeah. But but uh, you could still have a resolute will. Yeah, you're going to offend people oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Any law is going to have probably some some people who are offended by it but you just have to have a, mm -hmm. a will to do right but at the same time you don't want to overthrow your your state um by yeah. so all right let's keep going yeah there's a really good there's oh, a really good book by um i think his last name's henrickson i think it was his like dissertation or something called the immortal commonwealth um i think it's a cambridge Pre like it's in a series from cambridge press or something it's it's short it's very academic but it's short and it's it's good on on many of these things and kind of that idea that he gets at and he's drawing from Malthusius and people. Um, You'll have to send that to me. Yeah, it's 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 good. Uh, I think I just read it last year. Um, I have it around here somewhere. Anyway, the thing he gets at is some of these some of these ideas. He gets on to like when can you you know right of revolution and these these sorts of things, uh, the lesser magistrate doctrine. But the point is like the conception of the Commonwealth as predating and post-dating anyone alive occupying it now and that includes the ruler and so the the of paramount importance for everybody is to preserve this almost immortal thing which is the commonwealth that transcends everybody and so that should be um, motivating your actions both if you ever consider rebellion against a tyrant but also also the ruling of the magistrates of like they should be thinking about how do i i have to maintain the longevity of the commonwealth 
I can't let it dissolve and fall apart. And so anytime you're passing laws or on the flip side, not enforcing a law, like if you're not punishing blasphemers, what does it do? You know, so this sort of these sort of questions and it gets, you know, it's much more complicated, but therefore much more interesting discourse than what like passes for that, those kind of considerations today. But anyway, yeah. Fundamentally see here is, is that in their project, they're almost saying we're in a post-constitutional age. And because of the fact that we have blasphemy laws given to us, we can give blasphemy laws back to them. And I go, the whole American experiment is this. We can legislate morality without giving blasphemy laws. I can legislate morality without legislating religion. I can legislate morality without being an integralist. And that's where so much of this debate ultimately comes down to. Do you want a free society or do you want an integralist society in which blasphemy <laughs> laws are given to you from the state in order to enforce church morality? Here's yeah, the interesting thing. It's, it's which church is in control. Where, where yeah, so it's, again, like, and freedom, the, the idea of freedom is, is again, like, we could like a broken record here, but it's like, it's, it's post-war sort of freedom. Um, it's, yeah. Yeah, essentially the nothing. bifurcation he's setting up, which I don't know he, if yeah. he even knows it. It's the bifurcation of either you choose, it, either it's pre or post war. I know we talk about post war a lot, yeah. but I, 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 yeah. I mean, it's just, I think it's just essential to understand these things. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's that, that's the bifurcation, and we're on one side, he's on the yeah. other. So yeah. I think she's on. Yeah. She's at that particular time also, because right. that's where the whole thing is. When you look at the history of even good, solid Protestant Reformation folk, whether in England or here, um, when you have the power, you legislate your view. When you lose the power, they legislate that against you. So what's sauce for the goose can be sauced for the gander. Right. And I think that it's so important to highlight that the integralist view is attempting to then strip the entire nation of all of the intrinsic rights that, that our founders and uh, and the Bible show are uh, given by God and are inalienable Why? as our founders recognize. <laughs> and so we are then going from Why? a free society that that values genuine liberty and freedom and um, freedom in Christ, even as the Bible would suggest. Oh. <laughs> we're also denying the authority of Romans 13 and um, you know, and, and first that, Peter, denying uh, yeah, the authority first Peter of two and elsewhere that talk that. about how the, it's the civil government that carries the sword. It is not the church. And even though uh, Christ oh, established like that, like, a little bit. Yeah, but it's so it's so frustrating because it's like, I mean, <laughs> we're not saying that. Like the church, that's the whole point of I don't know, it's it's frustrating because like that the, every Protestant history would say you don't give. You don't the, you don't give the civil sword to the spiritual power. Mm -hmm. You don't give the spiritual power to the, like everyone has said that. Like even Roman Catholics, yeah. this goes back to Galatius or Glacius. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, when was it five hundred somewhere? I forget that. Always always yeah. forget uh, the year he, he articulated his two swords doctrine. But anyway, it's like like everyone has yeah. forever always affirmed a distinction of swords that they have mm -hmm. different objects and they have different penultimate ends. Um, you know, different subjects. I just, it's just, I don't know. It's like, no, why, why yeah. do we have to deal with this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Differently, yeah. obviously in old Testament Israel, that's not what we see in the church age. And we've got to take a break right here, but I want to be, uh, be back with more on Christian nationalism with Dr. Bill Roach. We'll be right back. With oh, well, legacy investments.com. Um, I guess they just got double Sponsors. advertised. I should, I should get money for that. Uh, anyway, yeah. comments thus far. Are we? Are we still? <laughs> uh, I are mean, we still able just, to continue? They're just. I mean, they're circling around the same thing. And I mean, that particular segment. Uh, it's just a lot of truisms strung together. Like you sort of said, setting it up at the beginning of this is how you would talk to a room of like layman boomers to say all this, the scary things that it's going to work to get them. They're probably going to buy the gold or whatever this investment ad is for, <laughs> you know, when they hear this yeah, stuff, it gets them. That would have been up. perfect. Yeah. I think, yeah. Uh, Jenna, I, I would recommend, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm jerk now, but <laughs> I mean, that's yes. like, I mean, just, it just, I don't, don't want to be the shoes. I'm just fits. trying to have fun, you know? Yeah. But all right. No, it's all fun. It's, I mean, you get, you have to be able to laugh at this stuff or it's too depressing to, to go carry on. So, <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not hearing there's not a, anything new, not not just in the conversation generally, but from even from both of them at this point, they just have kept circling the same, uh, you know, point. Um, I guess now they've re- the, the crescendo is really setting up the, the dichotomy. Um, and they're just going to say, you know, the one side denies liberty, whatever that means, just supposed to mean something to you. And it's sentimental freedom. Uh, freedom in Christ, apparently, of the, yeah. the Bible. You know, they're just saying things. It's like a, it's like a poli- bad politician. Who, who knew uh, that the, the freedom in Christ meant yes. that the perfect order was the post-war in court American constitutionalism? Well, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> who it's knew? Just, like that, it took that long, uh, 1930s or whatever it was, the 30 <laughs> years to enact finally it's, the it's perfect the blessing aim, of liberty. Um, yeah, it's an yeah. immense blessing of liberty that we live in the perfectly gospel-centered and uh, oriented society ever, um, and we and we, you know shame on us for being under, underappreciative of what we have. Yeah, I mean, if only like you know, fifteen fifty, like New England, like uh, England, you know, going through Reformation. If only they knew it was actually the nineteen eighties was the like pinnacle of Christian. Yeah, anyway, I'm yeah. being asked again. So let's get and they, <laughs> and they had, you know, they had examples similar to some of these things. And uh, at least in theory, even if not in practice, they knew of certain other alternatives, maybe not fully worked out. And they all consciously rejected them. I mean, that's the thing I get annoyed with all the time is like, well, you know, you see you see this in, in certain like radical two kingdoms guys or, or whatever. That's like the. Um, you know, it's uninterrogated assumptions is what the reformers carry over. Like they almost got everything right. Like the ref, the, you know, the Westminster confession was almost perfect um, except for these uninterrogated Constantinian assumptions that they carried in. And yeah. now that we got rid of those, like we've completed the reformation, you know, always simple reformanda and all this stuff. It, it just frustrates me to no end because they um, one, it would be a specious argument anyway, but two, they did actually consider alternatives and write about them and say in this, in the, you know, sort of classical style carrying, trying to be in this long conversation about types of regimes, models, you know, the, how, you know, liberty is supposed to be used, freedom, whatever, human freedom, uh, just rule sovereignty. I mean, they, they spilled a lot of ink on this stuff and everyone pretends like it was basically unaddressed until, you know, Russell Moore decided to take up his mighty pen or something and, and tell us all what the, Anyway, so yeah, it's just very frustrating. So please do the reading. I should have I should have titled this. Uh, it should just be called yeah. "Please Do the Reading." <laughs> yeah. when we look at this whole issue. We have to look at it historically, and when you look at it historically, let's, let's you're going dive to see into many of the vices that it can actually <laughs> oh, no. give to us. Oh, and we, we see how these things function. We've seen other groups within the United States try to do this. For example. Go to Dearborn, Michigan. What are they trying to do in Dearborn, Michigan? You oh, hear, yeah, he brings up the you Muslims. know the, the calls for prayer every day. You see people uh, taking over city councils. Yeah, I forgot about that. You see okay. People legislating um, Muslim Quranic belief. I mean, I guess I can give him credit for consistency. Mm-hmm. I, I think. I mean, I I want to give credit to the Muslims because they're acting according to would, these like good principles, but they're just yes, wrong. They have yeah. a false religion. I mean, exactly. I wish that we as a Christian people would do the same thing they're doing. Yeah. They they have like this um a confidence. Mm-hmm. Th- mm-hmm. They say that this well we're the majority and that's that's enough. We're going to enact yeah. our religion. I mean, I respect that even yeah. though it's obviously totally. false. Um so totally. yeah, I cited the William Prent example earlier which is his uh it's his treatise on Christian magistry, I think is the, t- the title of it. Um uh, one of his longer like pamphlets, but he says the exact same thing. He's just like this is inevitable all good societies do it. Um, it's it's laudatory in the sense that it's it's a, a, according to true principles of, of governance, uh, and he even use, he uses both uh, contemporary and, and biblical examples to illustrate that kind of like at length. Um, so I would say the same thing. I mean, I saw in the news earlier this week that like a similar Muslim community, very small, I think it's also in Michigan, uh, you know, banned all pride flags. And there's like nothing anybody could do about it because they control the council that's like 10 people or something. Like they just got all the seats. It's this little bitty town. And they said what was hilarious is they actually cited principles uh, in their public statement of religious liberty of the community. So the community, which is a much more uh, it's a way to view religious liberty 
in a way that is much more in tune actually with 18th century thought in this regard uh, that the founders would have been very aware of is like it's there is liberty, certainly in their private belief in, in these things as long as they're quiet and peaceable um, but even more importantly perhaps is the liberty of communities to be self-determinative in this way and to yeah. act according to those determinations um, as long as it's on you know good good true principles and for uh, good and true ends. So that's what this, you know, little community is doing. They're just like no more pride. To be fair, I think they even banned other types of flags other than the American flag. We're like, just none of it, like just get rid of it. Um, yeah. But they, but they cited the pride thing in general. They're like, we don't want this around. Uh, it's bad. And uh, it offends us as a community. So it's gone. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Great. I don't know. So, I mean, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, it, it's that like one of my I mean, this gives me an opportunity to say like one of my one of the things I want to do with the book is to provide a theological basis for for Christians to have the, the same type of confidence mm -hmm. theologically, um, philosophically that Muslims have to enact that kind in their local jurisdiction um, that they control. Mm -hmm. Is we don't have that. We're, we used to. I mean, you're reading some of these very yeah. self-assured, confident uh, Protestants in our our history, which only they died very only very recently. It's it's like wow, we used to be like this, and now look at us. Mm -hmm. It's just it's horrible. We're pathetic. Um, so yeah. No, I think he's going to continue into Muslim the bashing here. Experiment. And what are okay. they ultimately doing? They're undermining the freedom of religion through their jihad on the west oh here he comes he's gonna get me legislative he's process. gonna get me on this one well okay what if we were to do that as a form of christians they might say and i go well that's precisely in one sense what christian nationalists are trying to do so let me give you a little quote give me here. a money and quote. this comes from money. stephen oh. wolf's book and listen for one key word and you're gonna know it when you hear very it. scary and very to draw scary. the parallel it says this suppressing false religion in one's own land can be called a holy war <laughs> hmm. there it is. What, where do we hear that how do we translate holy war into arabic it's a jihad in that regard for the intended effects is the elimination of sacrilege in our time the suppression of false religion is not an end in itself but a means and matter of prudence see there you go I like that line well in on that line is that line is that's exactly a good one. That's, that's a good one actually i wonder if he even realizes that he's 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 that's like the most important quote so yeah i do say because i i think that's in the section where i talk about like holy commonwealth like in a sense yeah. that if you yeah. like the, uh, a people like clearing out like the sacrilege from their their community like i you know to i think to to say no rainbow flags on public buildings yeah that is a holy act like that. That's a, mm -hmm. there's something to that. And, and, and so, yeah, I, I get that, that, that line can be scary, <laughs> but if yes. you take it into the broad, the broad, um, uh, the, the, the argument of my I, book, I broadly I speaking, mean, it's, I, but yeah, I mean, th there is something in a certain condition. Like if you're like, we're going to clear mm -hmm. this, this idolatrous crap out from our public spaces mm -hmm. and we're going to uh, reestablish ourselves as a Christian people, there is a, a sort of holy act in that. And so, you know, whatever. I mean, you used to throw around this kind of language, uh, you know, all the time, this kind of, this kind of more, it sounds more charged uh, to us today because we, again, we're conditioned by more secular expectations. And this, the, of course, the, uh, the, the myth of, um, you know, in the liberal project as a sort of conflict mitigation model, as we understand liberalism today, um, one of the myths that props that up is that religion and religious differences were the, the cause of, of basically all the strife that predated the uh, you know, liberal triumph. The, the religion, it's irrational. It used to uh, cause irrational conflicts. Even if you believe it, that's, that's good. It might be true, but it's irrational to have conflicts over it. Um, you know, it certainly hasn't ceased wars and it certainly hasn't ceased empire. So both of those were, were utter failures if that's what it was supposed to do. Um, but it has uh, conditions you to where you think publicly these things are not worth uh, aggressive action on because they don't ultimately matter, which is a total psyop. And I've cited this before from uh, you know letters Jefferson had 
uh, to friends in like the early 19th century where he's saying, you know, the main thing to do, to do the best strategy, I think this was in Andrew Walker's, the review of Andrew Walker's book, I put this in there. It was like the best thing to do to superstitions, like in denominational strife, is to give it is to treat it with indifference so that it loses all public importance and it dies and then we'll we'll be free of it we don't need that and it causes problems and it's essentially what we've done and th this kind of rhetoric from him uh perpetuates what is actually a, a you know a myth of like religious violence is the the only bad thing about uh the the past several hundred years um and and affirms a a liberal secular liberal posture towards the public sphere as if um, there can't be any, any spiritual significance to things going on there. Um, and I, I do think that that contradicts the Bible, actually. So um, and uh, not to mention the Protestant tradition and even the Protestant ethos, which you mentioned of sort of confidence, self-assertiveness, um, you know, willingness to to uh, stake out a claim for the, the public morality and act accordingly um, is, is totally gone. So. I, I would love to see Protestants regain that confidence as well. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I that's what I hope um, we we can achieve. Uh, I, so we've been we've it's been like two, yeah, I was I mean I was, I'm two rambling hours and no I'm no no it's like <laughs> no no that's not yeah. the reason but it's like two no, two no, hours and forty minutes we, we've got through like twenty five minutes of this. Uh, it's, it's, there's it's, more to I'll go. Just, I, I, think, I think they begin kind of repeating themselves at this point. So. Um, we, I'm probably repeating myself at this point too. So yeah, I think we're fine. both going to end up just doing. Well, whatever. If um, two hours and forty minutes of uh, time and Klein's commentary is, uh, it's, you know, I'm sure people are loving it. So, um, but all right. Well, I guess you know, you want to call it a night. It's getting late. Yeah, we should we should call it. I, you I you got to drink another stuff. IPA yeah. and go to bed. No, no, no. That, it's already late. <laughs> I do got to go to bed. Um, <laughs> I didn't even get there. I, it wasn't until, like I said, the Quakers reminded me that uh, I had it here. So I was late getting to it, but they get me so exercised. I needed to needed to calm down. Um, anyway, this no, this is good. We didn't get through. Uh, I, I listened to that whole thing earlier. And yes, they do it at some point, just get much more repetitive. I think I, I had a few minutes to go at the end. It got, got boring, but we've covered the highlights in yeah, we've screwed. We've sufficiently screeded on all the, uh, <laughs> all and we've been pretty scenes, nice. I say. mean, we've stuck to like yeah. we've stuck to the yeah. audience, but we stuck to the, right. to the material. Yeah. All right. Well, let's call it a night. So whoever's still out there in the way out there, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, probably you know more to come. So all yeah. right. Yeah. All right. Bye bye.